twelve point five. Compensation of rupees four lakh and funeral expenses of rupees ten thousand will be provided to the nominees of the deceased advocates. Financial assistance will be provided to advocates on medical grounds to a maximum of rupees fifty thousand. On request of Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh, Government of AP also came forward to provide death benefit of rupees four lakhs to the nominees of deceased advocates. And also approved stipend of rupees five thousand to junior advocates. Disciplinary committees. Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh conducts disciplinary committee meeting every month. AP Bar Council has six disciplinary committee, in which each committee is headed by one chairman and consists of two members. Assistance provided during COVID nineteen pandemic. Under the leadership of Honorable Chief Minister Sri Vijay Jagan Mohan Reddy Garu, the Government of Andhra Pradesh allocated 25 crore rupees for the welfare of advocates. Out of this fund, the Council gave loans to 8,000 advocates, medical coverage to 15,500 advocates, and financial assistance to 600 advocates. Also, during the pandemic period, for the convenience of advocates, the Bar Council implemented an online system for filing enrollment, declaration, and medical insurance applications. Also, an amount of rupees three thousand five hundred was given to six thousand five hundred media advocates during the pandemic from the finances of the Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh and Bar Council of India. Here is an epitome of orientation programs conducted by Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh every month on legal topics by eminent jurists in several districts of Andhra Pradesh for the benefit of advocates. Digital automation. The Andhra Pradesh Bar Council offers automated digital services to advocates via its website and mobile app, allowing them to access services at their fingertips. Launch of e-services. The AP Bar Council launched an app to put its services at the fingertips of advocates. Advocates can check their enrollment, welfare, and COP details on the app itself. Advocates can register in the app and can get updates on upcoming seminars. Seminar videos can be watched by advocates anywhere through the app. Legal news and latest updates of Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh and BCI and legal articles will be posted frequently in the app for the benefit of advocates. Skill development for junior advocates. The Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh is conducting skill development seminars time to time for developing clinical legal education for junior advocates. A bridge course about advocate etiquette. Drafting and pleading is in conceptualization. Vision of Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh. The vision of the Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh is to launch a single window system for easier communication and to bring transparency and accountability among advocates, associations, and council. Thank you. Now I request. Now I request. Please, all of you, please kindly. Now. Good morning to everybody. Now I request all of you. Please kindly take your seats. Good morning to everybody. 
on behalf of the bar council of andhra pradesh and the visakhapatnam bar association i welcome the honorable judges chairman and members of bar council of andhra pradesh and advocate brother and sisters to the seminar now i request the chairman of the bar council and president of the today's seminar sri ganta ramarao garu to come and occupy the chair on the dais i request k appal naidu and sri katta jagannatham to accompany sri ganta ramarao garu now i request sri anuradha Lady Bar Secretary to present a bouquet to Honorable Chairman Sri Ganta Ramarao Garu. I request the Chief Guest of today's seminar, Honorable Sri Justice C. Praveen Kumar Garu, Judge High Court of Andhra Pradesh. I request Sunny Yadav and KP Sivaram Kumar to accompany Honorable Sri Justice C. Praveen Kumar Garu. I request MV Ramana to present a bouquet to Honorable Sri Justice C. Praveen Kumar Garu. Now I request guest of honor, Honorable Sri Justice Akula Venkat Sashtrai Garu, Judge High Court of AP to come over to the dais. And I request P. Sachinarana Murthy and Venkatesh to accompany Honorable Sri Justice Akula Venkat Sashtrai Garu. Now I request Y. Venu Gopal, General Secretary, to present a bouquet to Honorable Sri Justice Akula Venkat Sashtrai Garu. Now I request Son of the Soil, Honorable Sri Justice DVSS Swami Ajulagaru to come and occupy the chair. I request I.M. Ahmad and Sri K.V. Jagdishwar Reddy to accompany Honorable Sri Justice Swami Ajulagaru. Now I request Srimati S. Madhivi Lata, ex-member of Bar Council to present a bouquet to Honorable Sri Justice Swami Ajulagaru. Now I request Son of the Soil of Uttarandra, Honorable Sri Justice C.H. Manavendra Rai Garu <laughs> to come and occupy the dais, chair on the dais. Now I request Jeevan and Satchanarayana to accompany Honorable Sri Justice Manavendra Rai Garu. I request M.K. Srinivas to present a bouquet to Honorable Sri Justice Srikati Manavendra Rai Garu. Now it's my turn to invite Eng Dynamic and Son of the Soil, Honorable Sri Justice Chimalapati Ravigaru to come and occupy the chair on the dais. Now I request Sunanda to present a bouquet to Honorable Sri Justice Ravigaru Chimalapati Ravigaru.
Now I request Honorable Sri A. Hariharanatha Sharma Garu, Principal District and Sessions Judge Vishaka Patnam, to come over to the dais and read over the chair. And I request Narra Venkat Ramana to accompany Honorable Sri Hariharanatha Sharma Garu. And I request Paila Srinivas to present a bouquet to Sri A. Hariharanatha Sharma Garu. Now I request Sri. I request Varalakshmi to present a bouquet to Honorable Sri Hariharan Sharma Garu. Now it's turn to invite sons of the soil and members of the Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh and Vice Chairman of the Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh. Sri K. Ramajogeshwar Rao, Vice Chairman, Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh, to come and occupy the chair. I request N. Suman, Ex-President, Bar Association, Vishakapatnam, to present a bouquet to Sri K. Ramajogeshwar Rao Garu. Now I request Sri A. Ramiriddi, Member Bar Council of India, to come over to the dais and read over the chair. I request Kannari Appal Naidu to present a bouquet to Sri A. Ramiriddi Garu. Kannari Appal Naidu. Kannuri. Kannari. Kannari. Now I request former Vice Chairman of Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh, present member of the Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh, Sri P. Narsingh Rao Garu, to come and occupy the chair on the dais. Now I request U. Srinivasa Rao to present a bouquet to Sri P. Narsingh Rao Garu. Now I request senior member of the Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh, Sri S. Krishna Mohan Garu, to come and occupy the chair on the dais. I request Nulli Rama Rao to present a bouquet to Sri Krishna Mohan Garu. Thank you, sir. Now I request Sri Bhaipa Arun Kumar Garu, Member Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh, to come and occupy the chair on the dais. I request Govin, Sports Secretary, to present a bouquet to Sri Bhaipa Arun Kumar Garu. Now I request Dynamic President of the prestigious Bar Association of Vishakapatnam, Sri V. Ravindra Prasad Garu, President, Vishakapatnam Bar Association to come and occupy the dais. I request P. Hema Malini to present a bouquet to Sri V. Ravindra Prasad Garu. Now I request the Chairman of Bar Council, Sri Ramaragaru, 
to preside over the inaugural session of the today's seminar. Thank you. Now the prayer by Menakshi and the team. and other dignitaries for the lighting of lamp. Now I request the President of the Bar Association, Mr. Ravindra Prashad, to welcome the uh, guests and the delegates to the seminar. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of the Bar Council and Bar Association Vishakhapatnam, I respectfully welcome you all. And I take immense pleasure in welcoming 
సి జస్టిస్ ప్రవీణ్ కుమార్ జడ్జ్ హైకోర్టు ఆఫ్ ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ శ్రీ జస్టిస్ ఆకుల వెంకట శేషసాయి గారు జడ్జ్ హైకోర్టు ఆఫ్ ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ ఆనరబుల్ జస్టిస్ శ్రీ డివిఎస్ఎస్ స్వామియాజులు గారు జడ్జ్ హైకోర్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ జస్టిస్ చీకటి మానవేదనాథ్ రాయ్ జడ్జ్ హైకోర్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ అండ్ జస్టిస్ రవి చిమ్మలపాటి జడ్జ్ హైకోర్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ యూ హ్యావ్ గ్రేస్ఫుల్లీ కన్సల్టెడ్ టు బీ విత్ అస్ దిస్ మార్నింగ్ అండ్ అడ్రస్ అస్ ఆన్ వేరియస్ సబ్జెక్ట్స్ ఆఫ్ లా ఐ ఆల్సో వెల్కమ్ శ్రీ హరిహర్నాథ్ శర్మ గారు ప్రిన్సిపల్ డిస్టిక్ అండ్ సెషన్స్ జడ్జ్ టు దిస్ అకేషన్ and i welcome all the members of the bar council who have all come from various parts of the state of andhra pradesh i also welcome the member bar council of india from andhra pradesh mr reddy garu and i welcome these members of the bar judicial fraternity and law students and more particularly the junior members of the bar and law students after a very long time we are having a a seminar in Vishakhapatnam and I thank the Bar Council for taking this initiative and bringing this event to Vishakhapatnam. It is happening, I think, in some other parts of the state. But this is our turn this time. Thanks to the local members of the Bar Council, the Vice Chairman, Mr. Ramajogeshwar Rao, Mr. Narsingh Rao Garu, our brother Krishna Mohan and Bhai Parana Kumar for the initiative that they have taken for the purpose of bringing this seminar to Vishakhapatna. Coming to the very brief I will be, the major role of Bar Council is not just regulating the conduct of the lawyers, but also to propagate the knowledge of law. That is one major role the Bar Council is expected to play. And in the process, they also are associated with the law universities and law colleges. And for the first time after a very long time, they are bringing the knowledge percolation to the judicial officers and the legal fraternity. I'm very happy about it. Now coming to the learning part of it. The, 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 the learning these days has taken, like, unfortunately, back seat. The, out of the, the spelling L, learning lunch, L pakka kvedi pehendi. So our, our concentration had taken a different direction or a different tangent. So we need to learn. And uh, as, as, as mentioned by so many legal luminaries, we are expected to update the knowledge base because every day there is the, the, the judgment law is very fluid. It is not stagnant. The judgment is, which is passed today is, is, is overruled a couple of days after. So we are, we are expected to upgrade our knowledge base and there are the, the, the uh, examples are numerous. In fact, the recent judgment on Section 12A of the Commercial Court Act which mandated the process of conciliation before filing of the suit. The judgment of the Supreme Court is passed on the 17th of August 2022 which mandated that there must be conciliation process begun before the suit is filed, otherwise the plaint shall be rejected under the provisions of Order 7 to 11. But 10 days after, Delhi High Court gave a different perception. A different direction is given to the judgment passed by the Supreme Court. So unless we equip ourselves with the latest of the law, I don't think, my dear friends, we'll be able to uh, advise our clients in the proper direction. So for that process, for that purpose, it is very much essential that we should upgrade our knowledge and in the process advise the client. That is what our responsibility is, advise the clients in a proper manner. So the knowledge enhancement is very much essential and thanks to the, the technology these days, the present day lawyers have absolute access to, I should say easy access to the judgments, easy access to the knowledge. They can on a click of a button upgrade whatever they want. They can, they can have access to the judgments of the latest of the Supreme Court or any other high court. So in this process, I have a, I have, I have a suggestion, rather a request to the uh, learned judges of the high court. I think we have the senior most mem uh, members of the judiciary from the high court with us. Uh, I, I have a proposal, uh, your lordships, 
like the law clerks that you have in the high courts. There is a, I suggest that we should also have law clerks in the district court level. Let there be some 10, 10 advocates, 10 law graduates, I should say, not advocates, the way law clerks are, in, are recruited in the high court for, to assist the judges for a period of one year on a compensation of about 25,000 rupees a month, that's what is paid for each, each uh, law clerk. It need not be paid to the law, uh, that kind of money need not be paid, but let there be 10,000 rupees, some kind of incentive to the law graduates who passed out of the university. Let them be associated with the district judges in all the districts. So that will create a knowledge pool, which is very much essential for the purpose of the fraternity or the institution put together. Because from the lawyers become the judges. So the knowledge of the lawyers is very much essential for the purpose of protecting the interest or the enhancing the value or respect to the institution. Therefore, I, I request the learned judges who are with us to consider this proposition to have law clerks in the district court level also, so that there can be a better knowledge pool in the district court level. So I, with, the, with, this, with this very uh, brief request, I, I, I thank all of you for having uh, come to this wonderful uh, gathering. And I, I thank the members of the Bar Council for giving me this opportunity to say a few words. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Now it is my turn. Conducting a seminar at Visakapatnam and also Bar Council meeting become reality. Because almost last term, this term of course three years, we could not do anything because of the pandemic situation. Even in the previous term, in spite of our best efforts, all the members desire to have a, a seminar and bar council meeting at Visakhapatnam, it could not be materialized. On one ground or other, it could not be materialized. Now, I am very happy that it is happening today. It is in 2004, during the rhythm of Sri Senior Advocate D.V. Subbaragaru, as the Chairman of the Bar Council of India, Bar Council of India and Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh conducted a seminar on human rights. Justice Lahoti, the Chief Justice of India, yes, then was graced that occasion. That was the last program which could be taken place there after a wide gap. I am assuring all of you that this gap will not be maintained. This program of conducting the seminar will be a regular feature. And each month, at least one seminar in at least one headquarter of the district. It is the program undertaken by the Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh. It is already resolved. <laughs> My dear friends, to organize a program like this is a difficult proposition. Maybe today it is happening. Behind that, there, are lot, there will be a lot of efforts. Ultimately, it is the uh, persons who attend the program, which will encourage for further organization of the program by the organization. I, could, I come across a, a small uh, few words by Tolstoy. The most difficult subjects can be explained to most slow-witted man. If he has not formed any idea about them already, but the simplest thing cannot be made clear to the most intelligent man if he is firmly persuaded that he knows already what is laid before him. The difficulty is that we sincerely feel that there is nothing to learn. I learn everything in this particular subject. If anybody have such kind of opinion, then it is a misnomer. It is not correct. It is a version of law. Whatever we learn in the lifetime, it is only a drop of ocean. Therefore, my dear friends, first we shall realize, we shall understand the necessity and need of learning. 
it is every day process every time process it is a regular process continuous process there is no end nobody can say that i learn everything there is nothing to learn we invite the energy just for these programs because as advocates we are tend to have form an opinion only the case of our client we form an opinion that is a tendency therefore as a judge they hear both sides and they could present on both sides to us therefore we can see the entire picture about any particular situation therefore the learned judges we are thankful to the learned judges whenever we call them in spite of the busy schedule they traveling here spending time with us i know what kind of uh, pressure they are having in spite of that readily they accept each and every occasion when they invited us my dear friends in a visakha bar association legends are here like dv subbara garu rangana rangar each subject pl naidu garu and human rights side ravi shastri garu yendra mahan baulu varandaru kuda unnatundi pradesh idi the place that they practiced here the visakha people have a benefit of such a high talented personalities where you can learn by observation you are gifted with the opportunity to observe them therefore it is a visakha patnam which shall stand as an example to stand before any kind of uh, uh, formation because all these seminars workshops are temporary it is only to make all of us to realize there is something to learn more more something to learn in fact we are contemplating establish an advocates academy i am confident that with the support of my friends will be able to allocation of site from the government and i, pro I, I promise it the concern because the land advocate general is always been cooperating with us is in fact he should have been here due to some personal inconvenience he could not pre present here and he always ready and willing to represent the advocate community to do his best for the advocate community we are trying to get a side i am promising to the government with the confidence that by saying that he allot the site every infrastructure will be provided by ourselves by involving each one each one of us shall whether senior or junior within our capacity we shall contribute like a contributing a brick we have to construct a, a building a, a a a wonderful building for locating this educate academy which will take care of all these needs on a permanent basis i don't want to take much time because we are waiting for the uh, chief guest to deliver uh, uh, the uh, on this occasion inaugural address i request now mr ram reddy to give his message within 2 minutes please today's president ramarao garu chairman bar council of andhra pradesh today's our chief guest honorable justice pravin kumar garu honorable justice sheshai garu honorable justice dvs somyadul garu honorable justice manav rai garu honorable justice chevul bar ravi garu guests of this on uh, occasion of this function respected hariharna sharma garu district judge my friend ram jagesh rao garu vice chairman of the bar council of andhra pradesh my colleagues krishna mohan garu narsingh rao garu and my friend ravindra prasad president of the bar association my, uh, my dear colleague members bar council of andhra pradesh honorable judicial officers of this function my respected senior and junior advocates my dear students brothers and sisters good morning to everybody my hearty appreciation to the team work of bar association visakhapatnam 
with the support of Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh in organizing a one-day seminar. While the Bar Council of India is planning to organize a national seminar for advocates, I am glad to that our Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh has already started our move strengthening of the advocates. As a member of Bar Council, I emphasize the needed to establish a, a separate institution for skill development program, law academy for advocates, like judicial academy, judicial academy for the judges. Law academy is necessary to conduct a regular pro oriented program to all the professionals starting from June on various topics throughout the year. At this outset, I wish to inform you that Bar Council of India and Bar Council of India Trust together laid a foundation store at Bhones for Varissa for establishing Advocates Academy for Training Center and for law teachers in making good law teachers and lawyers. The Bar Council of India has also made a first step successfully to establish the International School of Law University in Goa and their plan we are established Advocates Academy also at their Goa. I wish one such academy for our Andhra Pradesh also, we are planning already, Rama Raghur told. Our Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh also making efforts motivating the government to conduct a district level workshops throughout the state. It's a great endeavor for the both Bar Council of India and Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh to initiate such institutions law from cells. While all the other professors are taken care of themselves uh, up to their knowledge and uh, skills. Government also encouraging to their professors in establishing institutions like name of the skill development programs. I personally feel advocates and advocacy is uh, most neglected in, uh, in throughout India. I wish to remain, sir, in this August to Limerick, the Honorable Judges of the High Court. Minimum immunities also no, not there in any many bar associations in Andhra Pradesh. There are no sufficient infrastructure and libraries, Wi-Fi, internet facilities. Many bar associations advocates are you know, not having any washrooms also, particularly lady bar associations, bar, lady washrooms. Other hand, security and protection for the advocates also a very big, big question, question mark. Many attractive projects are throughout the country, including the Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh. The Bar Council of India, including me, I am the one of the subcommittee who submitted the draft bill for protection of advocates, and that is uh, not yet uh, come to light. We are trying to, last week also we met the Union Law Minister, it is in progress. And uh, today, program, the topics covered are very interesting and useful today, day-to-day -day profession. The major branches of law, civil and criminal procedure courts are covered along with the interesting topic of common pitfalls we suffer and errors we commit and uh, how to overcome them. It is very much necessary to learn the court craft. It is known to everyone that ISR, ISR main reason of the pendency of the cases. The eminent scholars are here with, to us, with us today the, to share their vision and wisdom on revisions, applications, and the advocacy. It is good effort, and uh, I wish to, to all continue in the inspire of all bar association to come forward and organize such programs. The bar council is also planning to today workshop or national seminar to conduct at Vaisag and Vijayawada and Anantapur. Because of since two years, we are not able to get any such uh, work, workshops. For, for this academic year, we are planning to conduct Vishak Patmaso Bar Council of India national workshops. Once again, I thank Agrarnay, the Honorable Judges of the Court and uh, Advocates for this uh, Bar of Vishak Patnam and uh, respected our, my colleague, Bar Council members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanadal. Thank you, Ram Redigaru. I apply this to the dignitaries and the dais because in the hurry, to save the time, I could not address them properly. I apply this to them. I request uh, Ram Jogeshwar Rao to finish within two minutes without fail. Today's president of this function, Sri Ganta Rama Ragaru, Chairman Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh, 
our chief guest honorable sri justice sri pravin kumar garu judge high court of andhra pradesh guest of honor honorable sri justice akul venkata shashashai garu judge high court of andhra pradesh honorable sri justice db ss somayajul garu judge high court of andhra pradesh honorable justice sri chekati manavendra nath rai garu judge high court of andhra pradesh honorable sri justice chemarpati ravi garu judge high court of andhra pradesh sri he hariharanath sharma garu principal district and session judge vishakhapatnam my brother bar council of india member rami reddy garu bar association president v ravindra prasad garu p narsimha garu narsingra garu krishna mohan garu bai parun kumar garu colleague bar council members judicial officers senior and junior colleagues law college students and professors electronic and print media very good morning bar council of andhra pradesh has decided to increase the legal standards of advocate fraternity as well as law students in andhra pradesh as such we are organizing various seminars across the state the seminar is the best way to interact the experienced legal luminaries it will be very useful for our participants also by attending the seminars we can gain personal and professional confidence as well as communication skills also seminars are also useful to discover the attitudes attributes that is needed to success in our advocate profession to keep the legal standards our legal standards on par with the international standards bar council of india in with the support of state bar councils already established two prominent and prestigious law universities one is at bangalore national law school another one is recently started at goa that is india international law university university of law and research it is at goa this is very prestigious institute law and faith are the fundamental pillars we can we are only can promote law and faith in the society it is our legal it is our duty to protect the spirit of the constitution also our legal fraternity especially with our with our judicial system in india successfully set up the speed breakers to control the legislative and the bureaucrats for misusing their power that's why they are trying to dissolve the prestigious institutions like bar councils already has started medical council of india also are all dissolved already we are in next row so my appeal is we have to protect our institutions we cannot bear outers in, in our institution that is we should keep it mind very carefully if necessary which we should study to agitate it also the time is very short anyhow today we are organizing a great topics the eminent uh, judges presenting their uh, uh, allotted subjects kindly be there up to the end and uh, gain some knowledge also thank you very much thank you thank you ram jagesh nagar i request now we are waiting for the chief guest i call upon the chief guest sri justice pravin kumar gar to address all of us
ब्रदर जस्टिस शेषसाई सन्स ऑफ द सॉइल जस्टिस सोमया जलू जस्टिस मानवेंद्र रॉय जस्टिस रवि चिमल पाटिल प्रिंसिपल डिस्ट्रिक्ट जज हरिनाथ शर्मा चेयरमैन बार काउंसिल घंटा राम राव मेंबर्स ऑफ द बार काउंसिल ऑफ ए पी ऑन द डायस एंड ऑफ द डायस जुडिशल ऑफिसर्स फॉर्मर मेंबर्स ऑफ द बार काउंसिल मेंबर्स ऑफ द कंज्यूमर फोरम एज आई कैन सी सीनियर एडवोकेट्स एडवोकेट फ्रेंड्स लॉ स्टूडेंट्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू यू ऑल वेन प्रेजिडेंट ऑफ द बार एसोसिएशन वॉज एड्रेसिंग द गैदरिंग इन इज इनॉग्रल एड्रेस वॉज रेफरिंग टू द सन्स ऑफ द सॉइल आई थॉट हाउ लक्की देर इज नो सन इन लॉ हियर probably would have got sandwich between so many sons of the soil <laughs> definitely not uh, <laughs> bro some time ago maybe a couple of years ago there was a talk going on all around that somehow the standards of judiciary are coming down the comment was from the senior lawyers comment was from the judges comment was from the media as well like uh, seniors used to say that when they enter the court hall no junior is getting up to and giving a seat judges comment being that um, no standards are being uh, there lawyers are addressing in the manner they feel correct not following the professional ethics which are required that made me talk with ganta ram rao on one occasion as to whether bar council can do something my concern was with regard to court mannerism not on subjects probably must have deliberated with his members in the bar council and after much deliberation as a first step now lectures are being organized immediately after enrollment and i had an occasion to address young lawyers lawyers who just got enrolled on professional ethics court mannerism and judicial etiquette in recent past and i am told that this practice is being continued after i mean every week calling one honorable judge and asking him to address the gathering on some subject or on judicial ethics the second one is a seminar like this well as spoken to by as said by ganta ram rao the last one was in the year 2004 when the great dv subarao was the chairman of bar council of india and the function i think was in visakhapatnam what is the reason for having a function like this or a seminar one day seminar or two day seminar like this is it for fun definitely not is it for a get together no not at all then what for is this it is for the eng lawyers sitting at the back to tell them what they should do and what they should not do in a court couple with the knowledge of law to be imparted through these lectures 
friends what the speakers today are going to tell you are those things which you will not find in textbooks nor will your senior be in a position to tell you about what is to be done and how it is to be done because the seniors themselves will be quite busy in with their own work hence these lectures which if organized as frequently as possible in all the districts or if possible in the mafsal area as well with the limited resources available would be of very great help to all the young lawyers who are who have just entered the profession or you are likely to enter into this profession because as i have been telling everywhere in the last 10 years there is no shortcut to this profession and if you think shortcut is the way to go up it will definitely lead to a short circuit in your life you have to, there is there is certain set of things which you should learn before you intend to climb the law up well today's topics they are chosen after looking into the need of the lawyers who practice regularly in a court because what the speakers are going to tell you today as i said you will not find in any textbooks certain procedure nor will your law lecturer will be in a position to tell you during your college days these are the things which you learn either by hearing somebody or by watching the senior lawyers doing their case in the court today's topic topics are three civil procedure code with special reference to disposal of ias reference to disposal of ias i think it will be useful to the judicial officers also but sai just sai with all his experience at command on civil law will be able to tell you what is to be done in the ias which are filed regularly of course ias are bread and butter of lawyers also coming to the topic of coming to the topic the second topic advocacy common pitfalls and errors steps to overcome it was it is a topic about which i was referring to when i talked about my interaction with gantarama rao about the court mannerisms i was very particular with gantarama rao about this particular topic of course in different forums with different headings this topic has been addressed well i just tell you a few things about this topic but definitely not overstepping into the limits of justice somya ajlu with his permission i intend to tell few things when we entered the law profession at least i when i entered in the year 1986 we were told how to start a case the first sentence before narrating the facts or law or whatever it is we first say may it please your lordships or maybe may it please your honor why it is the word it is important because our arguments should please the court now slowly the it has become i may i please 
we are not here, you are not there before the court to please yourself. Your argument should please. Somebody should correct them. Who should do it? The senior or the court? Slowly, from May it, it has become, please your honor or please your lordships. Thereafter, now your lordships or your honor, and then simply started doing the case, which we are seeing every day. And an attempt made sometimes to correct is being taken as on a negative side and the lawyer is getting offended. Well, I think the Bar Council is the right place where these things has to be corrected. Second small incident, I'll tell you, two lawyers arguing a matter. Petitioner argues, and in the course of his argument, he'll narrate a fact or a law. The counsel appearing on the other side gets up and says, he is lying, he is speaking false, which we are seeing every day. I think my brothers also must be seeing, and you judicial officer sitting here also must have experienced. Can you use those words? See, nothing may happen if you use those words. But ultimately, the decorum of the court is to be maintained. And if you maintain the decorum and the decency, you will be glorifying your own institution. Probably the proper word, if I am right, is the counsel was not properly briefed, if he's a senior or if he's a young lawyer, you can say that he has not properly seen the record. Maybe something like that would really make the situation very pleasant. Then, one other thing, you complete your arguments. Case is over. What should you do? Can you just leave the court like that? No, you cannot. And at least I have seen, not many of them, lawyers with 10, 15 years of standing at the bar also do not follow this practice. What is that? You can't just tie up your bundle after completing the arguments and leave the court hall showing your back to the court. No. When can you show your back to the court? You can show it only after the next case is called by the court master. This is the practice which is coming up right probably in some years together. But somebody should be in a position to tell someone these are the things which you should do if you show your back to the court before the next case is called, then it may not happen, but a judge who is very particular about these things can haul you up for showing the back to the court. Well, friends, these are few things probably my brother may cover or may deal with seeing certain other things in an exhaustive manner. I leave it to this second topic there. Coming to the third topic, with the permission of Justice Roy, a few words on revision. We all know revisions on criminal side, 397-401. What is a revision? When can you file a revision? We also all know and you will also, you must have also read the provision, the students also must have seen, a revision doesn't lie against an interlocutory order. Then what is an interlocutory order? Is an application to 311 CRPC, an order passed on 311 is an interlocutory order? Is an order passed refusing to recall non bull warrants is an interlocutory order? Is an, is an order cancelling bail is an interlocutory order? Or if somebody wants to challenge an order granting bail, can it be done under 397 and 401 before the Sessions Court or the High Court, as the case may be? 
well subject looks simple but one has to learn many things on revisions as well justice roy with all his experience i think at the bar and also on bench would be in a position to tell you as to what revision is and under what circumstances can a revisional power be entertained by court probably with madhulima's case he may start friends these are the few things which i thought of sharing and with lawyer advocates academy likely to come up in couple of years if everything goes on well probably i think it will benefit not only to lawyers but to lecturers as well for imparting proper guidance to the law students this is the time dear friends dear young students for you to learn something because in this profession as i have seen very little is learned in college you will be knowing the law you will be knowing the judgments but practically how to present when to present in what manner it is to be presented will only be either by experience or by hearing lectures of honorable judges this is a great step which the bar council in collaboration with bar association of visakhapatnam has taken and i hope that this seminars of this nature will continue to take place benefiting young lawyers in years to come i inaugurate and also once again thank the bar council of ap and the bar association visakhapatnam for inviting me here to be the chief guest thank you very much thank you sir now we, it is the time to felicitate the chief guest because his lordship will leave i request the ramareddy garu and the vice chairman to and other members on the dais bar council members now the it is decided to continue the first session without disturbing the uh, present uh, movement so that we can save the time and uh, proceed with the further session a small make shift
ది ది ఆనరబుల్ జస్టిస్ శేషాయి గారు అండ్ ఆనరబుల్ జస్టిస్ రవి గారు విల్ బీ ఆన్ ది డయాస్ అదర్ డిగ్నటరీస్ విల్ బీ దేర్ ఫర్ ది నెక్స్ట్ సెషన్ ఐ రిక్వెస్ట్ మై ఫ్రెండ్స్ దేర్ ఇన్ ద ఫ్రంట్ సీట్ టు మేక్ అరేంజ్మెంట్ now i request uh, krishna mohan to propose vote of thanks for uh, this inaugural session good afternoon everybody at the outset i express my heartfelt thanks on behalf of the bar council of ap and bar association of vishakhapatnam to honorable Sri Justice Sri Praveen Kumar Garu, who accepted our invitation to be the chief guest of the present day seminar in, side, in spite of his lordship's busy schedule and to the inauguration, the inaugurating the seminar. While addressing the inaugural session, Justice Praveen, Reddy Garu, Praveen Kumar Garu observed that seminars of this nature earlier were conducted during the tenure in 2004 during the tenure of dv subara garu where myself and narsingh rao garu was also there and one word dv subara garu told to all of us we are none to anybody at ushapatnam when compared to delhi and to the supreme court advocates the trial courts we are pillars we are pillars of the judiciary so that is the standard of judiciary soli sarav ji fali nariman number of supreme court judges came there was three days long seminar at vishakhapatnam why i am again reminding what the in the inaugural session what pravin kumar gar said the standards are falling in the judiciary these type of seminars are necessary why because there should be a standard interaction between the higher judiciary and the bar council regularly to my opinion at least 3 months once in 3 months with bar associations throughout the state so that there be an interaction the difficulties that are being play, uh, faced by the between the judiciary and the council and the regular bar association you go to the invent of the supreme court judgment and not even a single day practitioner is becoming a magistrate or with that experience is working a district judge and the same is the fate of the high court judge i am not commenting on anybody anything in particular but the standard standard standards again wherever we go the thing what sir referred is that showing up back to the court what is this what is this a junior is not see offering a seat the same fate is in this high court every time pravin kumar reddy gar every sorry for pravin kumar gar regularly in every meeting he said what is the bar council doing for disciplining what is in our hands this is the supreme court was what thing i i endlessly request the the members the higher the senior judges here to sir one law academy is there so that we will go for a training to the advocates and also to the officers there is no academy after the division before division also even there is an academy it is not to that mark so we we the bar council members of andhra pradesh with the full strength and vigor are trying our level best to organize seminars to the upliftment and benefit of the members of the bar and the judiciary and the advocates at large and i also express my thanks to sri honorable judges of the high court of andhra pradesh sri justice av shashay garu justice dvs somyal garu justice chikad manvendra roy garu justice chemal pat ravi garu and sri harihar nath sharm garu principal district district and session judge who graced the occasion with his valuable presence i also express thanks to the management of the nvp law college nbm law college 
and also in Krishna Law College, Vishayapatnam, who have encouraged their law students to participate in one-day seminar. And I request the, before going to the speakers, for all you are waiting, to give a big applause to the inaugural session judge to Pravin Kumar Gar. Thank you all. I once again thank all the members who have taken their pains, Bar Council members, who have come all the way from all the districts and to grace the occasion today and for tomorrow. And thank you everybody for coming to that thing. I thank the organizing committee and the chairman for giving me this opportunity to few, uh, speak a few words on this session. Thank you very much. With this inaugural session is completed, but uh, same beginning of the first session. Presentation civil procedure code with a special reference to disposal of IAS. I quickly request Sri Justice and Dwarkana Redigaru. I am sorry. Honorable Member Dwarkana Redigaru, Brahmanand Redigaru, Chandra Shekhar Redigaru, Chadambarangaru, Chalsan Ajay Kumar Garu, and BV Krishna Redigaru to come on to the dais. I request Justice Chemalpat Ravigaru to take over and preside over the first session. Honorable <laughs> Brothers, Judge Justice Sesh Saigaru, Honorable Justice Brother Judge Swami Adilgaru, Bar Council Chairman Ganta Ramaragaru, and other Bar Council members who have come assembled here on this event, and other senior members, advocates. Lady members, law graduates, fresh bottles, staff, fresh bottles. the judicial officers, fresh and other retreats who have come all the way for this. We have assembled here a very good morning. I too came here to listen what senior judges are going to address on the subject, like you. I am also a beginner. But anyhow, I thank Ola Tilly for inviting me also by the chairman and vice chairman and president bar session. Ola Tilly, thank you, sir, for inviting me also. And uh, what Justice Pramit Kumar Garu said is 100% correct. I too concur with him. Law subject will come in due course by reading books, by practicing. But this morals, ethics, this body language, discipline, all this come, uh, will come only 
by seeing the seniors. These things will not come like a pill, taking a pill. We should develop ourselves and everybody knows what is the role of an advocate. In the beginning days, after I completed my law graduation, I enrolled as an advocate. I have in my mind, what is the role of an advocate? Simply wearing a gown and robes and wearing a bands is not an advocate. But something must be there. That I did research and learned a lot by seeing the seniors. And that is very important than the subject I, according to me, with permission of the judges. One should become a good member from the bar. Not only the, not only the client, to the bar, other side counsel, to other side client. While conducting cases, how, how to conduct case, not only by the subject, but also presentation. What Justice Pramin Kumar said is 100% right. Everybody can read Bar Council Rules and Advocate Act. They can know, but mere knowing the things is not sufficient. One should implement, practice, and proceed. Once they adopt these principles, they need not turn back, and they can become a good lawyer. Making money, getting claims is not only a successful lawyer, but his integrity, honesty to the profession, to his claims, to the bench are also equally important. With these few words, I too eagerly waiting to hear Justice Sash Saigar and Swami Adilgaru. I take leave. I once again thank you all, one and all, sir, for inviting me here. Thank you very much. గురజాడ నడయాడిన నేల కాబట్టి ఆయన గీతంతో ప్రారంభించుకుందామండి ఆయన అంటారు పూను స్పర్ధను విద్యలందే వైరములు వాణిజ్యమందే వ్యర్థ కలహం పెంచబోయి కోయి కత్తి వైరం కాల్చబోయి అంటారు ఆయన అదే మన మోటో కావాలి while speaking my learned senior brother sri c pravin kumar garu said and expressed his concern on the degradation of standards in the profession my opinion slightly different differs from it sir we have come to amravati in 2019 what i observe here after formation of new high court rather restoration of the old high court the young members of the bar are faring very well 
I hope that within a span of five years, we are going to have a dynamic bar in the high court. It would be rather appropriate to begin this session, first technical session of this program, by saluting two eminent and versatile personalities who are our founding fathers. First one, father of the nation, Sri Mahatma Gandhi, and another versatile personality and architect and father of the Constitution, Sri B.R. Ambedkar. <laughs> My heartful pranams to the elders who are present here and good wishes to the rest, especially to the persons are the students of fifth year law who are one step away from the noble profession. In fact, we welcome them also. In my opinion, these type of programs are required to be conducted. That's what the chairman also told you. Are required to be conducted very often so that we can have continuous interaction, so also introspection, which will be helpful for the system. Very often, we come across one thing, so and so should be done in accordance with law. What is meant by law? I invite the young blood. Those who are present there, finally year law students are also there. Would anybody share their thoughts? What is meant by law? We preach of law and we say very often it should be done in accordance with law. Anybody from the students, sir? Yes, please. Mic on, Mandy. Mic lay there. What is meant by law? Law, law cannot be defined without Mike, according to my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Please, sir. <laughs> law, in very simple terms, is nothing but in a society, what is just, fair, and equity to all the members of the society, that is law. In other terms, law is one which should not have any, uh, uh, any harm to the existing society. That is the law. In a simple term, I have said, but if you have to define law, it, it goes a very lengthy one. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. You're Anybody welcome, else? Sir. Anybody else? From the final year law students only. From the final year law students from any one of four colleges. Petal Namaskar, uh, In my opinion, the law, which, the law which brings every individual, every citizen of India at a common platform and give them a fair chance to stand in the society. Could you please be louder? Sorry, sir. Pedal Namaskar, In my opinion, law, which brings every citizen of India on a common platform and gives them the rights, give them the equal rights and opportunity to stand shoulder to shoulder to everyone and plays a very important role in a functioning a proper society. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Another thing which is bothering my mind is 
can there be a law contrary to the provisions of the Constitution? Can there be a law contrary to the provisions of the Constitution? Constitution, we know, the mother of all laws. Or is there any prohibition under the Constitution as such? Yes, there is prohibition. 13.2, Article 13.2 takes care of the situation, which mandates and says that any law made by the parliament or a state legislature inconsistent or in derogation of the basic structure of the constitution is a wide law. All of you know, laws can be broadly categorized into two. One is substantive law, another is Amma? Would you please stand up and say, you would like to know? Procedural law. Then what is substantive law? You are telling about procedural law. What is substantive law? Is there a difference between procedural and substantive laws? Yes, sir. Would you please enlighten? What is your good name? Malati. Would you please enlighten us, Amma? Yes, broadly it can be categorized into two. One is procedural law, another is substantive law. What does substantive law say? Rights and duties. Rights and liabilities. You are telling about various laws. What is meant by substantive law? Would anybody answer this? Make an effort, please. Hmm. Rules and regulations, that is called procedural law, according to you, sir. Substantive law deals with the rights and liabilities of the parties, whereas procedural law prescribes the mechanism, how the law needs to be enforced. That's what the procedural law says. I hope I am correct. Emma Malati. Adhanamma? Right, thank you. So in this uh, scintillating event, I have been called upon to share my thoughts. I don't say I should speak, share my thoughts on the subject, on the topic rather, civil procedure code and with special reference to disposal of interlocutory applications. Earlier speaker said, interlocutory applications are more precious than main suits. Isn't it, sir? Samuel Yes, sir. They are more precious. All of you know, the Code of Civil Procedure, when it came into force, Amma, it's of which year? 1908. It came into force in 1908. It was codified in 1908. When it came into effect? 1 1 1909. It was during British regime. Then, how many sections are there in the Code of Civil Procedure? Slowly, I am entering into IAS now. How many are there? From the students only not from the learner practicing advocate. From the students only. This is basically intended for students, I hope. Ramara, what do you think? Juniors also. Yes, sir. How many orders are there? From the students. 51. Then what is the object of these provisions of law? The object of these provisions of law or the CPC ultimately is the enforcement of rights, civil rights. Some important sections are 
I don't say that other sections are not important. Section 9, first of all, let us begin with the institution of suits. Section 9, what does it say? Would anybody participate in this? What does 9 say? We institute these suits. Let us give opportunity to others also, sir. <laughs> be brave. You need not feel shy. There is also a profession which needs that element. Brevity and braveness should be there. Amma, somebody is saying, please. What is the exception? Normal course of action, normal understanding is courts of civil jurisdiction have jurisdiction to try all the cases of civil nature. There is absolutely no dispute with regard to that. What are the ex exception to that? Is there an exception under section 9 of the Act? There is. Supposing a special statute prohibits institution of suits, even then can you maintain? You cannot. When there is a prohibition or bar under the special statute, you cannot maintain suit. That means alternative mechanism is created for that enforcement. Then next section of law is section, this very important section, section 10 of the Act. What does it say? What does it say? Somebody is raising his hand. Amma, would you please raise and say your voice? We want to see. Stay of suit. What does it say? What does that provision say? So ultimately, Two suits cannot be tried simultaneously according to you. Isn't it? What is the object behind this provision of law? What is the object behind this provision of law? It saves the court's time. Uh, then. Uh, no conflict of opinions judgments, mm, then that's all. So the ultimate object is to avoid the conflict of opinions. That's all. Good. Excellent. Then let us have a big round of applause for encouragement. The next provision of law, this is another important provision of law, that is section 11 of the Act. Emma? Yes, somebody from that. Yes, Emma, you are saying something. Yes, Emma, please. Emma? Res judicata. What does it say? And what is the object behind res judicata? Can you say? Can you say? Emma? Take four. Supposing a suit is instituted today and a judgment is rendered, can you maintain another suit? Tomorrow, for the same cause of action, between the same parties, can you do that? That is called res judicata. What is the object behind this provision of law? Anybody? What is the object behind this provision of law? Section 11 of the Code of Civil Procedure. Yes. There must be an end to every litigation. That is the object behind this. And this also safeguards litigant public from the onslaught of frivolous and vexatious litigations, isn't it? Then sections 15 to 20. 
what do these provisions say they deal with what 15 to 20 who initiate the suits in visakhapatnam what prompt us prompts us to say so or do so we institute a suit in visakhapatnam court why emma please 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 15 to 20 where the suit needs to be instituted these provisions say <clears throat> then 33 all of you know deals with the judgment and decrees supposing you are aggrieved by a decree passed by a trial court what is the remedy for you and what is the provision of law which deals with that Supposing suit is decreed or the learned judge refuses to decree the suit, what is the remedy open for you? And what is the provision of law? <coughs> Section 96, read with order 41. That is first appeal. There is another provision of law which deals with the second appeals. What is the distinction between these provisions of law, 96 and 100? One deals with the first appeals, appeal suits, and the second provision of law, section 100, deals with the second appeals. Could anybody? Distinction between 96 and 100. All of you know, yes, please. First appeal is a matter of right and second appeal is? Substantial question of law. It depends upon the discretion of the second appeal at court to entertain a second appeal. But first appeal in most of the cases is a matter of right because the lower court might err. So the first appeal is given as a matter of right. And anyone can knock the doors of the first appellate court, but not the second appellate court. Second appellate court can be uh, knocked only when there is a substantial question of law involved. What is meant by substantial question of law? How do you distinguish between question of law and substantial question of law? Sir, uh, Question of law can be a ground for first appeal also. But substantial question of law should be there in the second appeal. What is meant by substantial question of law? Sir, if you are asked to file a second appeal before the sup High Court under Section 100. Sir, to put it simply, substantial question of law Simple is... Simple can I am Sir, <laughs> sir uh, I believe substantial question of law is a question of law that is not determined by constitutional courts. Uh, question not decided by the... Constitutional courts. Uh, right. Uh. So, it is something that is uh, uh, resintegra and... Uh, uh, the either the Honorable High Court or the Honorable Supreme Court uh, has not delivered any judgment on that point of law. No judgment so far is delivered on substantial question of law. Isn't it? Yes, somebody is differing from his opinion. Who is differing? Somebody. Somebody was saying something. Slightly differing. Be brave. Share your opinion. No question of feeling shy. Amma? My key only. Material decision will... Of the huh? Material? Decision of the uh, court will be there, sir. And not binding by any precedent hmm. as well. That is called substantial question of law. Yes, sir. Yes. In other words, I want to put it in this manner. A question of law which substantially influences or affects the adjudication of the issues in the litigation, which substantially influences, that is called substantial question of law, not mere, merely a question of law, but all of you know the recent amendments to CPC were carried out in 2002. They came into effect from 17-2002. And then we are? 17-2002. And an amendment was made to section 100 of CPC. 
by insertion of 100 A. What does it say? In certain cases, second appeals are barred under that provision of law. It says, wherever the value of the suit does not exceed 25,000, no second appeal lies. Is it applicable to all the suits? This 25,000 value, is it applicable to all types of suits or only a particular type of suit? Only particular type of suit. Amma? Particular type of suit. Only particular type. What is that particular type? Chattara. Amma, anybody? Motor vehicle. Accident. Yes. Somebody is saying, could you please stand up and say? Motor vehicle. Amma? Yes, you are correct. Money suits only. So, another provision of law is section 151 of CPC. This one under the Guru Lad 151 of CPC, <coughs> which deals with the inherent power of the court. Supposing there is no other provision of law in the CPC to seek a remedy. Normally we file under section 151 of CPC. But when there is a specific provision under the CPC, you cannot file it. That objection can be taken by the other side. So apart from these sections, as rightly said by you, there are 51 orders which deal with the mechanism. Since we are dealing with the interlocutory applications today, rather specifically and specially, let us concentrate on them. If we treat the suit as a tree, if we treat the suit as a tree, its branches are interlocutory applications. Then what is the object of interlocutory applications? Would anybody enlighten? What is the object? You have heard so many speakers earlier also. What is the object behind these interlocutory applications? Uh, sir, Telugu uh, Chapacha, sir. Mr. Ma, ye bhastla na chipu. Okay, sir. Hmm. Uh, first time, after we talk, waste na puru evidence hai na lack po ina. Third party ni uh, unnecessary ga add chase na sir. Ante where there is uh, nowhere concern. So alan da puru wal ante right to remove or add parties and uh, uh, regarding uh, if there is no cause of action, uh, no disclosure of cause of action. Hmm. Under Order 7, Rule Number 11 of CBC, sir. So hmm. their uh, interlocutory <coughs> applications play a vital role. <coughs> you are focusing on only one provision of law. In general, what is the object behind these interlocutory applications? You may be correct to some extent. You're indirectly, you are correct. Antaran <laughs> Sarmagar. Instant relief, not permanent relief. Only instant relief, ma. Very good. This is another facet of the issue. Yes. Then, then, somebody is raising the hand. So this is the object behind it. Thank you. It is the preservation of the rights and the property pending litigation. Supposing suit is ultimately decreed, the person succeeding in the suit should not be deprived of the fruits of that litigation. This is the object of interlocutory applications broadly. I would like to place before you certain important IAs. It doesn't mean others IAs are not important because of time constraint. Because we come across this type of IAs very often in our day-to-day -day transactions and our profession and education also. 
I'm confining myself to only five today. Broadly, I will share my thoughts. The first application is Order 1, Rule 10. All of you know. Very often we come across this Order 1, Rule 10. This provision of law deals with the power of court either to strike out or to add the parties. And the parties in this way, Dangani, Alani, add Chidangani. Court to give a power undi. Court has that power either to strike out or to add the parties. <coughs> the condition precedent. Is there any limitation under this provision of law? Unless these conditions are fulfilled, nobody can enter into this suit. Are there any such limitations or anybody can file any application to come on record? Yes, Amma. This is not even lunch time. Another half an hour is there. Uh, pass over it. <laughs> Brahma Reddy are under Passover jail at Passover key. Next session, it will not be taken up. <laughs> Proper and necessary parties should alone be allowed to come on record. And a, whose presence is highly essential and imperative and necessary for adjudication of the issues involved in this suit. Then only they can be permitted to come on record. Then what is the object behind this? Object behind this is, object behind this is to avoid the multiplicity of litigation. There are various judgments on this aspect. <coughs> Explaining about the parameters of this provision of law. So one doubt is bothering me very well. Very often this doubt bothers me because of divergence of opinions. In a suit for specific performance of contract of sale, seniors, learned senior, seniors also can participate in this, sir. In a suit for specific performance of contract of sale, a third party who claims the property independently, independent of the rights of the parties to litigation, can he be allowed to come on record or not? This is for the floor. This is for the house. No, sir. Why? Supposing his property is in dispute, why he should not be permitted? Mike on Sarki. Mike, Mike missing, Ma? Mike on Sarki. Let him speak. <coughs> he has to fight independently. Yes, sir. He has to stand on his own legs. Yes. Yes, sir. Even his own brother. Even his own brother. Even a copasner. Even Kapasnar or Hates, any may any status, sir. Sir, one minute, sir. Any man of status. One, one minute, sir, would you please? Yes. Yes, sir. So, a third party, a third like party it, is a, not a part <coughs> of the agreement of sale. So, he cannot state his right and title in the suit for specific performance. That is the, of course, in previous years, 2005 Supreme Court, it was a, Accepted, but subsequent Supreme Court judgments are even latest in two. Let the mic reach you, sir. Yes. 2007 and 2007. Sir, please, sir, you can intervene. One minute. 2018 or 19 Apex Court judgment says no, a third party cannot be implicated in a suit for specific <coughs> performance for adjudicating of his title. Supposing, he has supposing has defendant remains ex parte. Excuse me, sir. Uh, of course. Even in such a case also, the Honorable Apex Court said, you have to file a separate suit. 
That's all. That is the Excuse me, sir. Now we will come to you, sir. Don't worry. That is the position of law as far as my humble knowledge. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Please. Sir, in the specific performance rules, uh, some of the persons implied as a parties. That is under section 19 of. Sir, I am not able to see you, sir. sir Other audience here, also. Here, here, sir. Here. Under section 19 of specific relief act. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Five of the ingredients are there. As per that, uh, the, those ingredients, some of the people are implicated as a part in this specific performance case also. Under under section 19 of specific relief act. You are striking on the head itself. Very good. Yeah. Very good, sir. 19. Yeah. But normal rule, as ruled out by the Honorable Supreme Court, is somebody said 2007. You said, sir. 2007, Tennessee C 82, brother. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. But our High Court, Composite High Court, expressed a different view in 1987. Of course, it is not a good law now, in view of the Supreme Court judgment. Sir, in one case, I came across a peculiar situation. The learned presiding officer who rendered the judgment was implied as a respondent. What should we do? Hmm? Should we encourage such sort of things? Justice Praveen Kumargar was saying these type of things. Learned presiding officer was implied as a respondent for the scene of adjudicating the issue. Ultimately, the Honorable Supreme Court depleted such action and imposed a heavy cost on that. Those things should not happen. In one case, a memorandum of first appeal was filed in the High Court. What I came across was Normally, we write in first appeals. Srinivas Raghur, unfortunately, these things are happening, sir, in some cases. Milad Pedal you have to take initiative, sir. In first appeal, in the grounds of appeal as a first round, what we write normally? Judgment of the court below is erroneous, contrary to law, weight of evidence, probabilities of the case, so on, so on, so on, forth. In one memorandum of grounds, Council wrote, judgment of the court below is erroneous, contrary to law, and corrupt. Should we encourage that? Should we encourage that? No. Not good for the system. Because of lack of guidance, ultimately. In another case, during the course of argue, arguments, that young chap was arguing very well. He was convinced to grant interim order. This is how the cases are being spoiled. Suddenly he said, the court below was influenced by the other side. She tolerate such things in the profession. We should not. These things are required to be taken care of by the bar, especially. Now, the next application is appointment of commissioners. What is the provision of law? Order 26 and section 75. For what purposes commissioners are appointed normally? Would anybody say? For what purposes commissioners can be appointed? For what purposes, sir? Yes, Amma. Right. Investigation, scientific investigation to note down the physical features, examine the accounts, partition of suits. Amma? Record the evidence after the amendments to the CPC. And what are the other circumstances where commissioner can be sought? Amma? 
చెప్పమ్మా పర్వాలేదు చెప్పమ్మా కరెక్ట్ గుడ్ థ్యాంక్ యూ దెన్ యూ మే గెట్ సో మెనీ డౌట్స్ వైల్ డీలింగ్ విత్ దిస్ టైప్ ఆఫ్ అప్లికేషన్స్ కమిషనర్ అపాయింట్మెంట్ కెన్ ఎ కమిషనర్ బి అపాయింటెడ్ ఫర్ కలెక్టింగ్ ఎవిడెన్స్ అండ్ టు ఫైండ్ అవుట్ హూ ఈస్ ఇన్ పొజిషన్ ఆఫ్ ది ప్రాపర్టీ yes sir somebody is saying sir sir nature of this suit nature of this suit can cannot be done injection there is an express bar for appointment of commissioner there is in any suit of sin injection commissioner cannot be appointed according that who is in physical position and enjoyment of the hmm but there is no bar as such when when there is a dispute as regards to identity of the property yes, it is. even an injection suits it can be yes you are correct sir you are correct sir another thing is whether the court has power to appoint a commissioner sumo to yes gordon agar yes but 2006 180 146 said no Two thousand six one eight eighty one forty six said no. Sumoto court has no power to appoint commissioner. Yes, sir. Somebody is saying something. Then what is the provision of law which deals with that? Or any other law made by the Honorable Supreme Court or the High Court? There is. Go ahead, sir. Undi. Yes, sir. sumo to a point another question which is lingering is whether a second commissioner can be appointed or not under what circumstances a second commissioner can be appointed yes amma please i will come to you also sir i will come to you yes are any illegal unless the first commissioner's report is scrapped can you appoint yes would you would you allow two commissioners report to stand at a time so the condition precedent is first commissioner's report should be scrapped first of all Scrap. somebody was saying something sir from that corner yes the uh, court has to satisfy the first the report of the first commissioner good excellent sir the court uh, has to satisfy yes then another doubt is in execution proceedings whether a commissioner can be appointed definitely for yes, yes, uh, opening the door lock or partition or something for reading the court assistance then for lock open the doors there is an express provision inserted what is the provision of law in order 26 rule 18a 18a i hope i am correct the next provision of law is order 38 rule 5 yes it deals with what order 38 rule 5 amma mobiles may be attached and take inventory immobiles need not be attached ah they definitely mobile sir not there is some uh. shopping complex identity hmm something what is the object behind this provision of law uh, for yes sir attachment before judgment sir attachment before judgment judgment what is the object behind this for not moving the jury section first 
Nema? Court will always be in the interest of the parties only. Don't worry. <laughs> what is the object behind this? Correct, sir. This is the benefit of seniority, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir, for your guidance. <clears throat> then another doubt is whether attachment can be affected on the property which is situated beyond the jurisdiction of the court. Beyond the jurisdiction of the court, now you have filed a suit, instituted a suit in Visakhapatnam court. Property is in East Godavari, Rajamandri. Can the attachment be ordered? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Can be attached. Amended. Hey, attachment is for judgment. Can be done, provided 136 is adhered to. Court has to send this warrant to the concerned court, district court, for getting it done. Another thing is, especially youngsters, they will have this doubt. <coughs> Supposing attachment before judgment is affected under 38 Rule 5, ultimately suit is decreed, EP is filed, is there any necessity to file another application for attachment? Not necessary. Not, not necessary. Not necessary? Not necessary. It does not cease with the disposal of the suit. Yes, as the reason for that, even though already some property was already attached, 385. Again, an attachment not, not necessary in the EP proceedings. What is the provision of law? The provision of law are the 21, 51 or 52, maybe correct. There can't be two provisions, sir. Ah, <laughs> 54. 38 rule 11, sir. Ah, 38 rule. Yes, sir, you are correct. Yes. Supposing. Attachment is there. Suit is dismissed for default. Then application is filed for restoration. Application is allowed restoring the suit. Attachment automatically gets revived. Why? Latest judgment of whom? Honorable Supreme Court? Emma? But what do you do with uh, Rule 11 A2? It has become redundant now. It doesn't. It doesn't. This 2003 AR Karnataka may be relevant for this. 128. Then coming to the summary suits. This 38.5 is applicable to summary suits also, under 37. 37. Applicable? Applicable. The next provision of law, which we come across in each, in every alternative case rather, are the 39 rules 1 and 2, injunctions. For grant of injunctions, all of you know, there must be Somebody is uh, slowly saying that. There should be three ingredients which need to be fulfilled. Prima facie case, balance of convenience, irreparable loss. Supposing an application is filed under Order 39 Rules 1 and 2. Application is dismissed or allowed. What is the remedy open for you? What is the remedy open for the aggrieved parties? You file first appeal against that? CMA. 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 What is the provision of law which deals with that? Order? 43. 43. Supposing injection is sought, 
instead of granting injection, status quo is granted. What is the remedy? Would you file revision or appeal still? Because day in and day out, we come across this type of problems in High Court. <laughs> Supposing status quo is granted, it is not neither injunction nor refusal to grant injunction. Status quo. Tamula which is a Tanku Saunde. Amma? Revision only. Anybody else? But the provision of law says any order passed under those provisions of law are appealable. That name 1 and 2, 43 takes care of it. Supposing order of injection is violated, what do you do? Contempt under sections 10 and 12 of Contempt of Courts Act. 39? Rule 2A. Correct. Rule 2A. By way of attachment of property or by arrest of the violator, but not exceeding three months. Another thing is, you may also file or institute suits against government. You know the provisions of Section 80 of CPC. First of all, you have to issue the notice. Question is, issue is, whether an ex parte injunction can be granted against the government or its instrumentalities. Can it be done? Man Karmana was in the ma. Sute se mundu. Ex parte injunction is tara leda. Obtain court permission. You watch Andy? The court permission, you have to file a petition first. To obtain the court permission. What about uh, class 2 of section 80, which bars? To suspend the notice first. 82 bars. 82. Yes, you're correct. Then, is there any time limit for disposal of injection applications? 30 days. When? Under what contingency? When ex parte injection is granted. Antenama? Correct. Maybe a repetition. Supposing injection is granted and is vacated. Injection is granted and the suit is dismissed for default. After registration of the suit, what is the fate of the injection application? It automatically gets revived. It doesn't. Fresh application needs to be, fresh orders need to be obtained. That is 2004, 6 SCC 398. Then, last but not least, which is a harshest remedy, Order 40. Order 40 CPC deals with what? Receiver's appointment. Emma? Receiver, receiver. Receivers. Receivers. Then what is the object behind this? For taking the properties. To preserve protect and manage the property pending litigation and determination of rights by the competent courts. Like that partition suit? I would like to know the leading case on this. The leading case on this. Emma? Chepan Paradu. Paradu. Chepan, Chepan, please tell. Chepan, Emma, please tell. Pancha? Ah, the Girgo chair. Pancha or go correct a mirror. This is Ram Swami Garu? Ye Ram Swami Garu? Madras High Court. Huh? Madras High Court. Madras High Court. Pancha Sadhachar, it is called. It was rendered by the Madras High Court in 1955. Pancha Sadhachar, five guidelines were stipulated. Five principles were laid down by the Madras High Court. That is 1955 Supreme Court 430. That is the leading case. Everybody should read that. Under what circumstances a receiver can be appointed? Partition suit me picture. Emma? Partition suit me picture. 
in a partition suit yes is very good question amma it's a what what amma in a partition suit whether a receiver can be appointed anybody from the house appointed can be appointed can be appointed at the cost of the co-partners co-partners అంటే పిల్లి పిల్లి దెబ్బలాడుకుంటే కోతి ఎత్తిపోద్ది టు ది ఎక్స్టెండ్ పాసిబుల్ దేర్ షుడ్ నాట్ బి అపాయింట్మెంట్ ఆఫ్ రిసీవర్ ఇన్ ఏ పార్టిషన్ సూట్ అన్లెస్ గ్రేవ్ సిచ్యువేషన్ ఈస్ దేర్ వీ షుడ్ నాట్ రిసార్ట్ టు అపాయింట్మెంట్ ఈజ్ ఇట్ ఎ రెమెడీ అవైలబుల్ టు ప్లెయిన్ టి ఫెలోన్ ఈజ్ ఇట్ ఎ రెమెడీ అవైలబుల్ టు ప్లెయిన్ టి ఫెలోన్ can be filed by the defendant also in the suit there is no bar sir then who should be appointed as receiver who should be appointed as receiver are there any parameters for that are there any limitations for this an independent impartial and disinterested person in the property should alone be appointed as receiver because ultimate goal or goal of the court is preservation of rights of the parties so this is broadly about the interlocutory applications thank you very much for hearing me patiently and i also thank you for your uh, participation and i also thank the chairman of the bar council sri ramarao garu and other members of the bar council who are present here and especially the sons of the soil who are the guiding force for me here i would like to conclude this uh, with the great words of the saint sri vivekananda he said i quote లక్ష్యం కోసం అలు పెరుగక లక్ష్యం కోసం అలు పెరుగక శ్రమిస్తుంటే నేడు కాకపోయినా రేపైనా విజయం సాధ్యమవుతుంది థ్యాంక్ యూ థ్యాంక్ యూ వెరీ మచ్ థ్యాంక్ యూ సార్ విత్ దిస్ నౌ దిల్ స్టేషన్ ఆఫ్ ద టూ లెన్స్ the fellow station of justice ravi garu chemal pat thank you sir with this uh, the first session comes to an end in quick succession we will start the second session before starting the section se- second session i request my friends to come on to the dais mr krishna mohan బ్రహ్మారెడ్డి ముప్పాళ సుబ్బారావు రవి గుబేరా రవి కృష్ణ వెంకటరామరెడ్డి గారు ప్లీజ్ కమ్ క్విక్ ది ప్రజెంట్ టాపిక్ ఈజ్ అడ్వకేసీ కామన్ ఫిట్ ఫాల్స్ అండ్ ఎర్రర్స్ సెప్స్ టు ఓవర్కమ్ ద సేమ్ without loss of time i request my lord just so me adil garu
Good afternoon, everybody. I am laboring under two difficulties here. One is to follow justice. The erudite justice, Sesha Sayagar, it is a very difficult task to follow. The second is I am conscious of the fact that lunch is organized at 1.45 and you, you will be naturally interested in that. So, I also got a warning from the Bar Council Chairman to keep it brief. So, I will adopt the summary procedure that Sri Sayagaru continued. But before that, I thank Sri Praveen Garu, Ganta Ramaragar for invoking the memory of my father, Subharao Garu. And the last conference that was organized here in 2004. I was one of the backroom boys then. I was not allowed to be on the stage because obviously I did not deserve the honor. So I know how difficult it is for a conference of this nature to be organized. And I am extremely happy and glad to see the turnout of the audience, particularly the young man in a blue shirt and a tie who was sitting on the floor and noting down, could you kindly stand up please? Thank you so much for making this all possible. It's like students like you that make topics interesting. Thank you. It is very difficult to organize a conference of this size and I am grateful to the members of the Bar Council for doing it. Both my learned predecessors have started on topics pursuant to their the exercise of their functions as judges of the High Court. Even I plan to talk on something very similar. What I have noticed are the common errors that are being made by correcting, by listening to CRPs, listening to appeals, hearing lawyers. With my experience, I want to place a few things before you. The first thing I noticed was a spelling mistake on the one day seminar is organized by, it is not organizing by. <laughs> this is what, this has become a second nature to all of us who are sitting in revision jurisdiction. We tend to look at the mistakes first and then at the substantive law next. You must forgive me if I make a few mistakes in the process. One of the most common mistakes that we are noticing is the plea of adverse position. An adverse position plea is a double-edged sword. Let us say, I know for a fact that Mr. Krishna Reddy is a very wealthy man. See, we are Reddy Kovuru is a very aggressive advocate. I'll use them as an example. Let us say Mr. Krishna Reddy files a case saying that Mr. VR Reddy Kovuru is interfering with my possession and enjoyment. Then Mr. VR Reddy takes a plea. I am in possession of the property. I have been in possession of the property for 30 odd years. Therefore, I am now the owner of the property. What is the inherent risk that Mr. V. R. Reddy Kovuri is running? The minute you plead adverse position, you accept the fact that the opposite party is the owner of the property, but his right has been exhausted by your open, hostile possession of the property. So whenever you take a plea, that, the op that you have perfected your title by open, hostile position, you run the risk of being non-suited right there. The minute you say, I am in adverse position, you are acknowledging that the opposite party is the actual owner of the property. Before you take a plea like that, be very, very careful. Apart from that, the other common mistake that is made you simply say, I am in possession of the property for 30 odd years, therefore I am the owner of the property. But that is not what the law wants. The Supreme Court has time and again said, if you want to plead adverse possession, you will have to state with clarity when you have entered into possession, how you are enjoying the property, whether it is in the knowledge of the opposite party, and your animus has to be proved. Unless all of this are, is proved, if I were the counsel, I'll simply sit down and say, Your Honor, my Lord, they pleaded adverse position. Therefore, I need not say anything more about my title that itself is enough to defeat the case. Be very, very careful before you think of raising a plea of adverse position. It is a double-edged sword. It could stab you and kill you right then and there. For all the young lawyers in the audience, this is a warning. I have seen this mistake occur not once, at least 10 to 20 times. That is the danger involved in a plea of adverse position. 
for the case law on the subject. Since I am in a summary proceeding, I will be rushing through it. The first of the AP High Court judgments is 2001, 5 Andhra Legal Decisions 102. The Supreme Court judgments on the subject are 95, 6 Supreme Court cases, page 523, and the latest Ramajanmabhumi case. Ramajanmabhumi case is also a magnum opus delivered by the Supreme Court. It, is, it has wonderful findings on Commissioner's report, how to treat archaeological evidence, how to treat edicts, everything virtually under the CPC is covered. A plea of adverse position is founded on the acceptance that the ownership of the property vests in another against whom the claimant asserts a position adverse. This is by a constitution bench. A plea of adverse position seeks to defeat the rights of the true owner and the law is not readily accepting such a case unless there is clear and cogent basis has been made out in the pleadings. Therefore, a person who claims adverse position should show on what date he came into position, what was the nature of his position, whether the factum of his position was known to the other side, and how long his position has continued, and his position was open and undisturbed. Only when you have all these five factors clearly in your control, with evidence, take the plea of adverse position. Otherwise, you run the risk of being non-suited right there. The second question I would like to that I have faced, and I would take a cue from my learned senior Sri Saigar, about interlocutory applications and a bar to a suit that he has slightly touched upon. This is also for the judicial officers who are here in the audience. When you are deciding an interlocutory application, can you take a decision on the maintainability of the list or the suit? When you are deciding an interlocutory application, can you decide on the issue of maintainability of the suit? Is it necessary for the defendant to plead that the suit is not maintainable for A, B, C reasons? Should an issue be framed? And then an application filed under Order 14.2 or 7.11 and then should he ask? Only then the issue of maintainability can be decided. As all of you know, an interlocutory application or a matter of this nature will take five to seven years. If at the end of five to seven years you come to the conclusion that the suit is not maintainable, the court doesn't have jurisdiction. Have you caused greater harm to the plaintiff or to the defendant? Why should you preclude it from your consideration at this stage? What do you mean by a prima facie case? Should you not think that a prima facie case also includes a prima facie conclusion on the maintainability of the suit? Why should you shut it out from your zone of consideration? Yes, anybody? So you say it should be done or should not be done? Obviously, without pleading, I'll come to that. No pleading business later, but under which provision of law? Order 7, Rule 11 is a different issue. I'm only on the maintainability of a suit when a prima facie case is being decided. Yes, it can be decided at the interrogator. How would you like the court to decide that? Good. Okay, I'll take it. Suppose it's a suit, let us say under 69 of the Partnership Act. It is an unregistered firm filing it. When the defendant comes before you and says the suit, the plaintiff, the, the partnership firm is unregistered, should you wait for the written statement to be filed? Frame an issue and then, call, and then give a decision on the matter or can you decide it before that? My humble view, particularly to the judicial officers, is don't shut it out from your zone of consideration. By, when you say prima facie case, what you are saying is that I am of the prima facie opinion that the plaintiff has made out a case that is likely to succeed. If there is a bar pointed out at the very outset, how can you say that you are of the prima facie view that it is likely to succeed? If the bar is clear, like under the Wax Act, a tribunal is created, or under the Partnership Act, where the firm is not registered, my humble request to all of you is don't shut it out from your zone of consideration. The case law on that, the first of the cases, 1993, three Supreme Court cases, 161. 
the purpose of a temporary injunction is just to maintain the status quo. Before any such order is passed, the court must be satisfied that a strong prima facie case has been made out by the plaintiff on the question of maintainability of the suit and the balance of convenience, etc., etc. At the final hearing, while vacating such interim orders of injunction in many cases, it has been discovered that while protecting the plaintiffs from suffering the alleged injury, more serious injury has been caused to the defendants due to the continuance of the interim order. This is what I was saying. At the end of the day, you will cause greater harm to the defendant by continuing the injunction in trying to preserve the status quo. Please look at 1993 SCC online, Calcutta, page 42. We have no hesitation in holding that while deciding the existence of a prima facie case, a court must consider the maintainability of a suit or an action for the purpose of its prima facie satisfaction. Total exclusion of such a question from the zone of consideration of the court may result in granting a relief in a proceeding which is statutorily not maintainable. To ask the court to shut its eyes would be a travesty of justice. In this connection, we would like to add that depending at the stage on which the court is invited to deal with a prayer for interim order, the court may decide whether the issue of maintainability should be taken up for a preliminary issue or not. AR 96 Madhya Pradesh, page 47, is directly on the point. Thus, if the matter relates to the, I'm sorry, I hope I've not to, 96 Madhya Pradesh, 47, those of you who are noting it down. Thus, if a matter relates to the jurisdiction, territorial, pecuniary, or inherent lack of jurisdiction, it strikes at the very authority of the court to pass any decree. Hence, to my mind, it can be raised at any stage. It will serve no purpose if in a case where there is an apparent lack of inherent jurisdiction, the parties are forced to file a written statement and then a preliminary issue is framed and thereafter it is held that the court has no inherent jurisdiction to try the case. 2005, 10 SCC 704. The plea of jurisdiction goes to the very root of the matter. The trial court, having held it, had no territorial jurisdiction to try the suit. The High Court should have gone deeper into the matter. And until a clear finding was recorded that the court had territorial jurisdiction to try the suit, no injunction could have been granted in favor of the plaintiff. Therefore, I request the learned counsel suit appearing in a case where there is an inherent patent, and why inherent? Patent, inherent lack of jurisdiction due to a statutory bar or otherwise, to raise the point at the very outset agitate your claim, invite a decision from the judicial officer hearing your matter. And to the judicial officers who are here, my request to you is take it up. Don't leave it to the court to ultimately decide after issues are framed. This is the second point that I wish to bring to your notice. The third question, these are all issues, ladies and gentlemen, that we have seen while we are sitting in the High Court and disposing matters. Issues which could have been answered at the trial court are coming up. Therefore, these are matters which you can avoid. The third question that is often there is, an objection is raised that a person coming to court does not have the power of attorney to give evidence. Is the power of attorney actually necessary or an authorization actually necessary to give evidence? 118 of the Indian Evidence Act says anybody who has the competency can give evidence. On behalf of others, nobody can give it. Doray garla nenu matter le na. The yes, on behalf of others, you can't give. You also, you anybody who has personal knowledge of facts of a case can give evidence. Often, an objection is taken and it is recorded that the that the particular witness is not competent because he does not have. Suppose he is a manager of a bank. Before he was a man, he was a cashier. At that point of time, he was one of the witnesses to a promissory note and other documents. Does he need a power of attorney to come and give evidence? Evidence can be given by any person who has knowledge of the facts of the case. If he does not have knowledge, you demolish him in the cross-examination. First and foremost question would be, were you posted there? Do you have personal knowledge? Did you, were you present when the documents were executed? He will say, no, no, no. That's the end of the story. But I have noticed CRP is coming. 
where a matter is stopped at that stage saying that since he did not have authorization to give evidence, he is not allowed to give evidence. This is again a simple flaw which can be awarded. If those of you want some case law, AR 97 Bombay 225, direct judgment on the subject. I don't want to read it because time is short. Next question that often arises is a very, very vexed question of a document being used for a collateral purpose. Many of us in the course of our practices will come across documents that the other side objects is stating that this document cannot be received in evidence. There are two types of objections here. One is about the mode of proof, the capacity of the person to give evidence, etc. The other is about the very inherent nature of the document itself. A document required by law to be registered is not registered, yet it is sought to be marked, etc., etc. The question is, all of us think and proceed on the basis that it can be used for a collateral purpose. What exactly is this collateral purpose? In a, let us say, a suit for eviction based on a lease deed, plaintiff is suing for eviction of the defendant. The lease deed is not registered as required under law. It is sought to be marked in evidence. Objection is raised. Then you say, please use it for a collateral purpose. In a suit for an eviction, what is a collateral purpose? You are seeking the eviction of the defendant on the ground that the tenancy has expired or you have terminated the tenancy by a statutory notice. What is the collateral purpose then? And judgments, those documents are being marked. Issues are being entertained on that. In a suit for eviction, there are only one or two issues. Whether you are the landlord and whether you validly terminated the lease. What exactly is the collateral purpose for which we are marking this document? This is another area where a mistake is very often made. In a term, in a lease deed, is the term of a lease a collateral term or an important term? Is the rent a collateral term or an important term? Suppose there is a dispute in an unregistered lease deed about the quantum of rent. The defendant says, no, what is written is not correct, the rent is much lower, I will only deposit that to avoid the 15A difficulty. Then, very often we find the documents are being marked even though they are not capable of being admitted in evidence. This is another area where all of you should be careful in my opinion. 2009. 2 SCC, page 532. This was a case where 2,70,000 was paid for transfer of a property. A suit was filed for recovery of the 2,70,000 paid as advance. The document was not at all stamped. So the argument was advanced that it can be received for a collateral purpose. But if I think many of the judicial officers would be aware of it, act practicing. Section 35 of the Indian Stamp Act says, it cannot be received in evidence for any purpose, whether it is collateral, primary, or otherwise. It cannot be received in evidence if it is under 35 of the Stamp Act because that is a curable defect. He can pay the deficit stamp duty and if necessary the penalty and bring it back into evidence. But if it is under the Registration Act, it requires registration and is not registered. Then, what exactly is your collateral purpose? Please look into 2008, eight Supreme Court cases, 564. There is a very wonderful discussion about what exactly is a collateral, para 34. A document required to be registered, if unregistered, is not admissible into evidence under 49 of the Registration Act. Such unregistered document can, however, be used as evidence of a collateral purpose as provided in the proviso to 49. A collateral purpose must be independent of, divisible from the transaction to effect which the law requires registration. If a document is inadmissible in evidence for want of registration, be very careful. If a document is inadmissible in evidence 
for want of registration none of its terms can be admitted in evidence and to use a document for the purpose of proving an important clause would not be using it for a collateral purpose none of the terms of the said document can be used for proving for for proving the case if none of the terms can be used neither the period of in the example that i gave neither the period of the lease nor the rent etc can be considered this is an area in my opinion which requires a little further elucidation further search because there is a judgment to the contrary in a suit for eviction you give a notice then you say quit, mat, quit notice is given therefore he has to vacate the only issue there would be what is the period of the lease if he doesn't deposit the rent the question of deposit of rent no 106 has also been whittled down and watered down so what remains and this is what the supreme court said not once more than once if the terms of a document are inadmissible none of the terms can be looked into i don't know i hope one of you writes a judgment which comes up and some one of us has to decide it you want to 2008 eight supreme court cases 564 this is a case where a where a landlord sought to evict a tenant this is a company saying that this is given to a particular company for the use of one particular well, officer general manager regional manager whatsoever somebody else was put into possession of the property so the landlord had said i am i have given this lease for a particular purpose for a particular grade of an officer to use it somebody else is up so the question there was whether a term of this lease can be looked into or not be very careful particularly the judicial officers when you are marking such documents collateral purpose therefore according to me is a wide open issue in fact there is an unreported judgment of the supreme court of india 1969 one unreported judgments page 86 those of you who have manu patra it's manu sc 562 1969 this is of three judges of the supreme court there the honorable supreme court held a document which requires registration and which is not admissible for want of registration to prove a gift mortgage or sale is nevertheless admissible to prove the character of possession of the person who holds under it i don't know when this will be resolved but as of now there is this difficulty this unreported judgment of three judges clearly says that the nature of possession can be proved and according to the earlier judgment nature of possession is an important term of the agreement which cannot be used this dichotomy has to be resolved some can argue that the unreported judgment is not a judgment on the merits of the matter it's a judgment very peculiar to its own facts etc etc but i hope some of the, some of you will have the opportunity to resolve this issue so those of you who want to raise an objection to the admissibility of the document the question the next question that logically arises is when should you raise it how should you raise it the all the practicing advocates would be aware the judges would be aware of this when should an objection be raised about the admissibility of a document before marking before the marking the documents before. before the marking when can it be questioned after marking when they question when you have to, when you start an argument you have to complete it if you want an order <laughs> What do you mean by as per law? Uh, requirements of the stamp act and the not compliant with section 92. Uh, even though it was marked, you didn't say it cannot be reprinted, it can be deemed. Uh -huh, admissible docs documents. Yes, sir. M. Sitharamurthy Garu will disagree with this because. <laughs> he has written a judgment which i did not agree in fact we discussed about it also but that's a different issue but the fact remains once a document is marked in evidence can it actually be de exhibited particularly under the stamp act is an issue that needs a decision 
an objection as to the marking of a document, particularly when it pertains only to stamp act, should be raised before it is marked. Because these are curable defects which should give an opportunity to the opposite party to cure the defect in the document, pay the stamp duty, whatever, and then bring it back. But if the document is inherently inadmissible and it is marked, what would you do then? A document which wants registration is not registered. It should be mandatorily registrable under 17 of the Registration Act. It is not registered. And no objection is taken to its marking. It is received in evidence. Court can take? Yes, court can take. If the doc document, madam, can be impounded when it's a deficit in stamp duty. Therefore, they pay the duty and the impounding part is cleared. But if it requires registration and it is not registered as required under law. It's not a question of 20 days of, of the Registration Act here. My high court lay practice just Nirandhi. Not a question under 22A, it is a question of a civil court receiving a document which is not capable of being received in evidence. Anyway, we are running short of time, so therefore I will just give you the case law on the subject with a brief explanation. The, here also, I find that there are two judgments of the Supreme Court, or three rather, which are opposed to one another. The first is the case of Bipin Shantilal Panchal, 2001-3 SCC, page 1, where his lordship, Justice K.T. Thomas, while writing the judgment, considering the fact that matters are getting delayed, gave a, a practice direction to the trial court judges. It's an archaic practice during evidence collection stage whenever an objection is raised regarding admissibility of a material in evidence. The court does not proceed further without passing an order on such objection. But the fallout of the other above practice is this. Suppose the trial court in a case upholds a particular objection and excludes the material from the case final, material from being admitted in evidence and then proceeds with the trial and disposes the case finally. If the appellate or the revisional court can ta could take a different view on the admissibility of the material in such cases, the appellate court would be deprived of the benefit of evidence because that was not put in evidence. Why should the trial court prolong that unnecessarily on account of practices created by ourselves? Such practices, when realized through the long course of long period to be hindrances which impede steady and swift progress, the better substitute would be this, to mark the objected document tentatively as an exhibit in the case or record the objected part of the oral evidence subject to such objections to be decided at the last stage in the final judgment. If the court finds at the final stage that the objection so raised is sustainable, the judge or magistrate can keep the evidence excluded from consideration. This is the first finding of the lordships. But in Venkatachala Gounder's case, 2003, eight Supreme Court cases, 752, a different view was taken. Order 13, Rule 4 provides for every document to be admitted at evidence being endorsed by on behalf of the court by being signed or initialed by the judge. This amounts to admission. So therefore, the objections that admissibility of documents can be that the document itself is inadmissible in evidence, but the objection is about the mode of proof, alleging the same to be. In the first case, merely because the document has been marked an objection as exhibit, an objection to its admissibility is not excluded and is available to be raised even at a later stage and in the revision also. In the later case, that means when the mode of proof is incorrect, like I don't have personal knowledge, I am trying to depose about Mr. Doraya's case, then they say the later, the objection that it should not be admitted in evidence should be raised immediately. But you, this is a a caution which all practicing lawyers should adopt. The judicial officers are, flame, are faced with a very unenviable task in this. In Shalimar Chemical Works, 2010, eight Supreme Court cases, again the similar issue came before the Supreme Court. 
And the Supreme Court took the view the trial court should not have marked the documents and it committed an error. The issue, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, is still not free from complete doubt. Whether the judge should immediately record it and immediately decide on it, whether the judge should postpone it is only left to the individual discretion and the knowledge of the judges and your good luck lawyers on that day. <laughs> if you are lucky, you might get an order if you are not. But this is an area which you will have to be very, very cautious as practicing advocates. Any, any objection as to the admissibility of a document for want of proof, that the manner of proof should be raised there and then. Do not delay it because later you cannot raise it. But if it is a question of inherent inadmissibility of the document, I still feel personally that it is open for you to do it. The next question that arises from here is that if a document is marked in evidence, but there is no proper pleading about it, if both the parties argue on the merits of the case, including the document which is marked without there being any pleading, can you consider such a document or not? The document is marked in evidence. There is no proper pleading about the document. But both the parties advance their arguments on the issue involved, including the document. The cardinal rule that all of us are taught, that all of us grew up with, no pleading, no evidence. That is the bedrock on which we argue our cases. But if both the parties go to court, argue a matter without there being adequate pleading, both are conscious of the issues involved, both argue it on merits, then? Well, no pleading, no evidence, you have at least 50 judgments of the Supreme Court or more. Hmm? And to a pleading lap in a chase here, too. They may suit for injunction, they may declaration it, too. Hmm. Does law of procedure is also the law. Just because justice and equity, can you ignore the fundamental concepts of our jurisprudence, including no pleading, no evidence? Or when can you ignore it? Otherwise, I'll rephrase it. When can you ignore it? All the? When? Can the judge by himself do it? Suppose the judge notices that neither of you point out a fact. There is some document which is on which both submitted arguments. There is no pleading about the document at all. Or no adequate pleading. Let's put it that way. Evidence? Evidence need not be pleaded. That's a fact. No pleading, no evidence. You have to lay Suppose you want to claim a right in the property. You, can you simply file a document which are saying how you acquired the property, where you acquired the property from, how your right has been crystallized? This is another issue which has come up. I had to, I had the pleasure of listening to a couple of very capable counsels. That's why I'm here before you raising this as an issue. Yes, madam? Yes, madam. Suppose the court does not make an issue on it. And both argue. Suppose the court does not frame an issue. The court will only frame an issue if the pleading is clear and is visible from the record. If no such pleading is there, the court can the court frame an issue in the first place? Issues can only be based on pleadings. They can't be otherwise. So if there is no pleading, Okay, suppose a suit for an injunction is filed because documents are filed. Can the court frame an issue? Can I grant a declaration or is the plaintiff entitled to a declaration of title? Court cannot make a new case for you parties. Then, this is where the difficulty arises. Anyway. Sir, you No, no. Sorry?
ఇన్హెరెంట్ ప్రొసీజర్ అంటారు ఏం క్లెయిమ్స్ సార్ ముప్పై ఏళ్ళ క్రితం ఆక్యుపై చేసి అవును దట్ ఆర్ ద వెరీ ఫస్ట్ పాయింట్ దట్ వి డిస్కస్డ్ వాట్ ఈస్ ద నేజ్ మియర్ లాంగ్ పొజిషన్ ఈజ్ నాట్ ఇనఫ్ టు డిఫీట్ ద కేస్ ఇట్ షుడ్ బి ఓపెన్ హాస్టైల్ పొజిషన్ విత్ అన్ ఇంటెన్షన్ టు డిఫీట్ యువర్ కేస్ దెన్ ఇట్స్ ఇన్ కనెక్షన్ విత్ దాట్ ఇన్ వాట్ వే యూ హ్యావ్ టు ప్రొసీడ్ ఆన్ ద బేస్ ఆఫ్ ద సైటేషన్స్ యూన్ బై ది వేరియస్ హై కోర్ట్స్ యాజ్ వెల్ ఎస్ బై ద సుప్రీం కోర్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఇండియా టు క్లెయిమ్ బ్యాక్ ది ఇఫ్ ఓన్ ప్రాపర్టీ from the occupier unnecessarily you will have to file a simple suit for a declaration that you are the owner of the property and for a consequential order to evict him from the property because when you seek a declaration he will come up with a plea of adverse position then the court will decide whether or not your title is still there or it has been exhausted because of his open hostile position thank you that is exhausted you will get your decree now this issue about no pleading no evidence is another vexed issue which is coming up the first of the cases that i'd like to bring to your notice is 872 supreme court cases 555 872 supreme court cases 55 this is a case of a person who was given a property on a license all of you know under the easements act when permanent constructions are made a license is normally terminable at will when permanent constructions are allowed to be built a building let us say this property is given on license to a person and he builds this hall he can claim that you allowed me to build it therefore it can't be terminated at your own sweet will this was a case where there was no pleading in the case that i have constructed a permanent building therefore i cannot be evicted under the easement act the supreme court noted this but held the plaintiff went to court full knowing fully well that the defendant's claim was that the license was irrevocable on the ground that they had made permanent constructions incurred expenditure in pursuance of the license granted the plaintiff knew the case he had to meet and for that purpose he produced so and so in evidence of his plea that the license was a simple license and it was revocable and that this question was considered in great detail by the learned judge Mr Kakkar then constituted that the mere execution of a work at a permanent character and incurring expenses would not make the license irrevocable the licensee must plead and prove by positive evidence that the licensee acting upon the license executed works of a permanent character this is the case it is well settled that pleadings need not reproduce the exact words or expressions as contained in the statute nor the question of law is required to be pleaded substance of the respondents pleading clearly informed that the case was they made constructions on the land acting upon the license it is true that the pleadings raised in the written statement did not expressly use the words that the school had executed works of a permanent character acting upon the license with this situation also the honorable supreme court clearly said both the parties went to court knowing the other party's case both of them argued on the merits of the matter raised the issue incidentally therefore they said even if there is no pleading the evidence can be considered this is the first of the judgment so ar 1966 supreme court 735 is also a question on that but as a practicing lawyer what would you do when they if it, today earlier when chief examination used to be conducted we used to sit very alertly in court if something was beyond the pleading instantly we used to raise an objection saying that not covered by pleading objection but now that cut copy paste has come in and affidavits are being filed what do you do when you realize that some part of the affidavit which is being filed into court is not actually covered by the pleading as a practicing lawyer what would you do because you also know the other risk if you do failure to cross examining would mean accepting the case suppose abc points are set up point number c is not adequately backed by pleadings should you cross examine the witness on point number c or what is the precaution you would take if you don't cross examine you 
the party may argue, I have put my case on paper, he did not cross-examine, therefore this part is accepted. But you feel it is beyond the pleading. Once an affidavit was filed, what do you do? I would, I mean, it's an opinion. My learned brother, Mr. Roy, who's a very experienced judge and others can agree or disagree. I would say, you file a memo before the judge, saying that this part of the evidence is beyond the pleading. Therefore, I am not cross-examining him. Or, if you have the capacity, limit your cross-examination and get it recorded. You have pleaded certain things which are not covered by the pleading. You are stated certain. Therefore, I am not cross There, Then you will not run the risk of the plaintiff arguing, despite my clear evidence, he did not cross-examine, therefore deemed to be accepted, etc., etc. Sorry? Somebody is saying? The other way out is, of course, asking for recasting of the issue. Even if an issue is improperly framed, you will have to be very alert there and get it recasted. Uh, I'm, the reason why I am drawing your attention to this branch of law is I find that it is steadily improving. I brought to your notice two cases. Again in 2008, 17 Supreme Court cases, 491. 2008, 17 Supreme Court cases, 491. The same point was issued, was raised and decided. But one important caveat, at least for the judges, is in paragraph 17. Another aspect to be noticed is that the court can consider such a case not specifically pleaded only when one of the parties raises the same at the stage of the argument by contending that the pleadings and the issues are sufficient to make out a particular case and the parties proceeded on the basis and had led evidence in that case. When neither party puts forth such a contention, the court cannot obviously make out such a case not pleaded suo moto. When neither party puts, such forth, puts forth such a contention, the court cannot make out a case not pleaded. Sujatagar, I think that answers your doubt. It is for a counsel to point out that the, even though there is no adequate pleading, parties have led in evidence. Both of us knew what the other side's case is. We were conscious of it. We went ahead. You can tell the court to decide. The last judgment on the subject is the recent judgment, 22, 2022, one Supreme Court cases, page 115. 2022, one Supreme Court cases, page 115. I still have three minutes. The other issue that Sai Garu raised is another issue that has been troubling us, the issue of status quo. We notice many judicial officers say, let status quo be maintained. What exactly is the status quo to be maintained? Invariably, all my learned brothers would agree that the High Court is faced with a situation where one side says, sir, I am maintaining status quo. Other side says, I am maintaining status quo. The status quo is one of the most vexed issues that the High Court faces. Whenever my request to the judicial officers is. I know it is easier to write a status quo order than a full-fledged injunction order after discussing prima facie case, balance of convenience, etc. If you feel in the circumstances that a status quo is to be granted, please specify what is the status quo you are meaning. Status quo about position, status quo about the construction, or you yes, say the municipality is demo likely to demolish, but please maintain status quo with regard to the demolition notice. Unless you give that let us say there is a case of demolition. They file a case saying that Ill illegally, without consideration of the provisions of the HMC Act, they are demolishing my... If you say status quo, the municipality will say, I gave a notice. I want to demolish the property. You wanted to maintain the status quo. I am doing what I am... And you have not prohibited me from doing it. Mr. Ramaseshu, Anand Seshu has many cases against the Vijayawada Municipal Corporation. That is why he is laughing the heartiest. He has at least 10-15 cases in my court itself. <laughs> so therefore, whenever the judicial officers are giving an order for status quo, I mean, this is incidental to what I wanted to talk, so I got raised, sir, I got Please clarify what is the status quo that you are giving. And as practicing counsels, please ask the court, order which is the party the Please seek a clarification, what exactly is the status quo that has been ordered by the court? This can lead to practical future difficulties which can be avoided both for judicial officers and for your parties. Seek a clarity then and there. Normally it happens. It happened. 
No, no, sir, I am not saying we do not understand the meaning of status quo. But as is where is what? Of the, uh, of the particular activity, correct? That is what? Suppose the municipality is seeking to demolish the building. The court merely says status quo. Municipality will argue, you didn't prevent me, you said maintain status quo. I am continuing to do what I was doing. So the explanation has to be given that uh, you are not supposed to go ahead with the activity. That, that is a prohibitory order. Saying that you are not supposed to do is a positive prohibitory order that should be passed. You say status quo, when I am interfering with your property, your case is that I am interfering on a daily basis. Every day, morning and evening, is sending his men, material, bulldozers with the police aides, etc., JCB, etc. And continue to maintain the status quo would mean I will continue to do what is not prohibited by the court. That is why I am requesting you as a counsel to seek a clarification as what exactly is the status quo that has been granted. The status quo is not the status quo. In the second ADJ court, there is a lot of people in the second ADJ court. In the 5th, we were arguing a case. Now, now, Krishnamon. There was a case in the 5th ADJ court. There was a chamber in the 5th ADJ court. There was no doubt about the argument. In the case of the Rangers, there was a case in the 5th ADJ court. There was a case in the 5th ADJ court. There was a case in the 5th ADJ court. There was a case in the 5th ADJ court. There was a case in the 5th ADJ court. Amagar Velval, Pierre Le Krishnamon Gardha in the Naki. So it does work. I mean, I am not saying that the courts are precluded from giving a status quo order. But the question would be, it can lead to difficulties. And if you don't seek a clarification, you will end up in the high court fighting. Again, for the SOM scramble for position, the same issues would come up before the Supreme High Court. Therefore, when an order is being granted, the judicial officers, in my humble opinion, should be careful of mentioning what exactly is the status quo they should they direct to be maintained. The councils could, should also ask what exactly is the status quo that we are getting. It can lead to practical difficulties. So I think with this, my alarm has not yet rung. I put the alarm for 1.50. I know there's a good lunch waiting for all of you. I don't want to stand further between you and your lunch. It is always a pleasure to come back to Vizag. I owe my existence to this great city and this great bar. I am what I am because of the Vishakapatnam Bar Association. It always feels good to come back to this paradise called Vishakapatnam. This hall also has a sentimental effect. One minute, sir. 148 can send a petition. <laughs> My father, as the chairman of the Urban Development Authority, laid the first hall. The first hall was constructed here. That was the old uh, children's theater, which is now demolished and magnificent structure. In 2004, when the Seminars were organized, this hall was not there, so therefore we were aware. And I'm grateful to all my seniors for mentioning my father's name. People forget very easily. After 2004, the city of Vishakapatnam is hosting such a lovely conference. <laughs> Madam, that is pending in the court. I will not comment on it. This is not the, you can implead yourself, Madam, and argue, but this is not the venue or the time. That's a very, so I'm grateful, particularly to the members of the Bar Council. I wish you every good luck in your endeavors. I hope you organize more such programs. And it's so heartening to see the young students. When we were growing up, we did not have this opportunity. You are very lucky. Make the most of it. Enjoy yourself. You are entering into a very, very great career. All the very best to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I request my friends to join with me to felicitate the Honorable Justice Swami Asla. No doubt, sir. We are very sorry for pressurizing, sir, because of the lack of time. Thank you, sir. Now on, we are on, in right time for going for lunch. So shorten your time and come fast so that every day we eat lunch. But this opportunity you will not get again and again. 
there for any other interesting session is waiting for us please come quickly as quickly as possible so that we can
petitioner is in possession of the property and grant injunction, or if the court finds that he is not in possession of the property, dismiss the uh, petition for temporary injunction. But you cannot order for status quo. Status quo means what then? Do we mean that uh, petitioner is the plaintiff is in possession of the property, or the defendant is in possession of the property? Therefore, it is clearly held that in such petitions filed under Order 39 Rules 1 CPC, order of status quo cannot be passed. And recently also, the present our High Court also held in one of the judgments, which, have, which was disposed of by me also, that status quo orders cannot be passed in the petitions under Order 39 Rule 1 CPC. You decide either the petition is in person of the property or not, and if you, if you find that he is in person of the property, grant in temporary injunction, and if you don't find that he is not in person of the property, dismiss it, that's all. You can't leave the matter like that by passing a, stat, a power of status quo. Now, the other issue relating to adducing evidence where there is no plea that was raised by Justice Swamiji, very interesting question. There's a the provision in our CPC which says that uh, any amount of evidence that is adduced without a plea cannot be looked into. So that is the fundamental principle of law. Any evidence that is adduced must be in consonance with the plea or pleadings. And if you adduce any evidence beyond the pleadings that cannot be looked into is the basic principle of our civil, civil procedure code. But as pointed out by Justice Swami Adilgar in various judgments right from 1966, that when a pa both parties adduced evidence, knowing fully well that there is no plea, and both the plaintiff adduced evidence on a particular aspect which is not covered by the pleadings and which is not covered by the issues, and defendant also did not, without any demur, has participated in that uh, trial and proceeded with the evidence, and he also adduced evidence, then this, the, that is an exception to the general rule that uh, no amount of evidence adduced without a pleading can be looked into. The court can take a departure from that rule and can hold that even without there being a pleading, as both the parties consciously led evidence on a particular issue, the same can be considered by the court. So, uh, uh, not only the Supreme Court judgments, even our uh, High Court of Andhra Pradesh also, if I remember correctly, in 89 or 90, clearly held that such evidence can be looked into and be considered. This is for the benefit of the young advocates here who are uh, participating in the session and the law students who can make a note of this. Because it's a rare issue which you will come across at the time of uh, trials and in final, at the time of final adjudication of the cases. Now coming to my topic, revisions. Revisions in criminal law. Chapter 30 of CRPC deals with uh, revisions. Now, Chapter 30 deals with both reference and revisions. Now, we are not concerned with uh, reference. We are concerned with revisions. Section 395 and 396 of 30 deals with reference. And from Section 397 to 405 deals with revisions. First, you need to know what is revision and what is the intention of the legislation in introducing this chapter 30 by way of providing a remedy of revisions to the litigant public? What is the reason? When revision lies, first of all, we need to know. Any young advocate or any advocates who are participating in the session or the law students can answer this. When revision lies and what is the Intention of the legislation in providing this uh, remedy of revision in criminal law. This is this. We, first, you need to know this. Anyone? Nobody. Oh. See, revision first of all lies only when there is no remedy of appeal provided against a final order. So, when there is a final order, if right of appeal is not provided to an aggrieved party then revision lies. So first it must be a final order. Then when no right of appeal is provided against that order, uh, that order in the scheme of CRPC, then revision lies. The underlying principle is that 
no one should be left without remedy that is the principle of law so when there is a final order passed by a court of law and when no right of appeal is provided then what is the remedy to the aggrieved party therefore the concept of revision is introduced in section 30 of chapter uh, of crpc for example i can i can quote example for ready reference you take an order of under section 125 crpc granting maintenance or refusing to grant maintenance a final order a petition filed by the wife claiming maintenance against husband will be allowed ultimately in the final adjudication no right of appeal is provided against the order to the husband who is an aggrieved party by that order or even when the petition filed by the wife is dismissed and no maintenance is granted then no right of appeal is provided to the wife who is being aggrieved party therefore it is a since it is a final order and as no right of appeal is provided against that order revision lies under section 397 crpc another instance is that in cases where under 376 crpc is the relevant provision where a metropolitan magistrate or a chief judicial magistrate convicts a person and imposes a sentence of less than 3 months for example 1 month or 2 month or less than 3 months then the aggrieved party who was convicted and sentenced to that imprisonment he has no right of appeal because section 376 says that no appeal lies against that order of conviction judgment of conviction and sentence so since it is the final order and as no remedy of appeal is provided revision lies similarly in a similar case where only fine of rupees 1000 is imposed uh, sorry 100 is imposed then right of appeal is not provided that is the final order there no appeal lies against that order therefore revision lies so these are the few instances where we can cite as apt examples to explain the scope and concept of introducing this uh, remedy of revisions in chapter 30 of the crpc now the next important question because time is very short i am not going into going deep into the matter your chairman has given me only 45 minutes time up to 3:30 saying that uh, this they have to hand over this hall to the <laughs> organizers after 3:30 so before they neck them <laughs> neck neck out, neck out all of us from this hall we'll complete this session status huh? <laughs> okay now before that the regional jurisdiction under section 397 crpc is the concurrent jurisdiction this the jurisdiction is conferred both on the sessions courts as well as the high courts therefore the aggrieved party can as well approach either the sessions court or the high court the option is with him since it is a concurrent jurisdiction the powers of session judge under the uh, chapter 30 while dealing with revisions are dealt with in section 399 of crpc whereas the powers of the high court under revisions is dealt with in 401 of crpc and a limitation is provided in section 401 clause 3 crp stating that when a revision is preferred against an order of acquittal the revisional court cannot while allowing the revision petition can convert the order of acquittal into conviction so there are certain limitations also provided in the code while dealing with revisions under section 397 crpc now i would like to touch upon the most uh, vexed question relating to the revisions whether a revision lies against interlocutor order just now we have been discussing that revision lies against a final order against which no right of appeal is provided now whether a revision lies against an interlocutor order 
397 class 2 CRPC is relevant in the context to consider, which imposes a clear bar on the revisional courts, both on the sessions courts and also the high courts, to entertain revision under section 397 clause 1 against an interlocutor order. Now, what is an interlocutor order? Then comes the next question. The order what is interlocutor order is not defined in CRPC. But all orders which are passed during the pendency of the main case relating to certain aspects which is touching the rights and liabilities of the parties are called as intermediate orders, uh, interlocutor orders, or an orders which are passed as a step in aid relating to the trial of the case is, are called as interlocked orders. So, to, be, to, to simplify it, I can, what we can say is that an order which is passed during the pendency of the main proceedings is called an interlocked order. For example, to summon a document under 91 CRPC or to summon a witness under 311 CRPC or to recall a witness for further cross-examination or further examination or interlocked orders or sending a document for examination by expert under section 45 of Evidence Act. These are all considered for instances as interlocked orders. Now whether revision lies against this interlocked order, most controversial question which is bothering the, vexing the courts and both that bar and the courts for all this length of time. The, the, this bar 397 class 2 CRPC was first introduced in the 1973 amendments. Earlier, prior to 1973, we don't have a provision like 397 class 2 CRPC in the scheme of the code imposing a bar to maintain revision under, under 397 clear against an interlocutor order. The Law Commission has submitted a report pointing out the difficulties which the litigant public are facing in this regard. Prior to 1973, every interlocked order, the parties used to question the same in the regional courts and obtain stay of proceedings. And consequently, the trial process is being stalled or prolonged or protracted for years together as stays are being granted by the regional courts in revisions which are preferred against interlocked orders. So to cut this practice of stalling the proceedings and trial in the trial courts by obtaining stay of proceedings in the regional courts, this 397 class 2 CRPC was first time introduced in the 1973 amendments imposing bar on the revisional court to entertain revisions against interlocutor order. This is the legislative history behind incorporating the new provision under section 397 class 2 CRPC. This you need to make a note of it. So this is the intention of the legislation in incorporating this 397 class 2 CRPC in the code, imposing bar on the revisional courts to entertain revision under against revision against interlocked orders. Now the interesting question is already we have dealt with what is interlocked order is not defined in the code or nowhere. Now, first time after the 1973 amendment, in Amarnath's case, question arose when uh, taking cognizance of case or refusing to taking cognizance of case amounts to interlocked order or not, whether revision lies against that order or not. Order or not. If the question behind the, before the Supreme Court in Amarnath's case, which was uh, disposed of in the year 1977. Suppose a uh, private case is there, private complaint is there, and a 202 inquiry will be conducted initially. Then the magistrate has to find out whether there is a prima facie case to take cognizance of the case against the accused or not. If a magistrate finds that there is a prima facie case to take cognizance and try him for the said offence, he will issue summons. So you will take cognizance of the case. Suppose if the magistrate of the 202 inquiry find that there is no 
prima facie case to take cognizance of the case against him and to try him for the said offence, he will dismiss the complaint under Section 203 CRPC. Now, whether this is an interlocutory order against which revision lies or not was the question before the Supreme Court. Then, very interestingly, the Supreme Court held that uh, Supreme Court has carved out a third order called as intermediate order. So we have final orders, which we know usually, we have interlocked order. Supreme Court has now carved out by way of this judgment law an intermediate order. What is this intermediate order then? Supreme Court said very interestingly, please go through that Tamarnath's case. Next case is Madhulimiya's case. Two important judgments on this aspect. Both 77 Supreme Court is Amarnath's case. 78 Supreme Court is Madhulimiya's case. Which throws light on this very important aspect relating to these intermediate orders. Supreme Court said that uh, the Parliament missed its attention that apart from the final order and apart from interlocked order, that there would be another order called as intermediate order and Parliament did not deal with that order, whether regional, revision lies against that order or not. And so you see, after reading the judgment, you will just really appreciate the wisdom of that judges, the legal thinking, and widening their mental horizons to provide adequate remedy to the litigant public. That's why the, the then judges of 1970s of Supreme Court are so great, we consider still. They say that, uh, first they have interpreted what is final order. They said that an order which would have the effect of terminating the main proceedings of the case one, uh, once for all is a final order. And nobody can dispute with that aspect. Now if this order of taking cognizance is questioned, suppose if that is accepted by the divisional court, and if the Revisional Court says that, no, the magistrate had committed an error in taking cognizance of the case without there being any prima facie case against him and set aside the order. What would be the effect? It will terminate the main proceedings of the case itself. Therefore, they have construed this as a, an intermediate order and said that, again, those orders revisionalize. Though it is an interlocutory, passed at an interlocutory stage, but as this order, if upheld or reversed, would have the effect of terminating the main proceedings of the case itself, we have to construe it as an intermediate order against which revision lies. Now that is 77 Amarnath's case. Now you consider another case, 78 Madhulimiya's case, relating to discharge. You, you will be having a case under section 324 or some other section, 354 or something. Now you file a discharge petition at interlocutory stage before the trial commence. So there is no material, absolutely there is no evidence, no allegation against him, therefore no charge can be framed against him. That is the petition you have filed and it is your argument before the court. And magistrate dismisses it. Now you question that order. No, no right of appeal is provided against that order. Therefore, you, you comes under revision. And if revision in revision court say, no, it is an interlocked order, I don't enter in 3972 is bar. There they said, no, no. Suppose when that order is challenged with the revisional court, if you find that magistrate erred in not discharging him, without, because the revisional court finds that there is absolutely no evidence against him, no allegation against him to try him for the offense of 324 or 3.4, whatever it may be, and he is entitled for discharge, what would be the effect of that order? It will terminate entire proceedings uh, in that middle case. Therefore, again, they have considered, relying on Amarna's case, this order can be considered also as an intermediate order. Therefore, revision lies. So, ultimately, to test whether a particular order which is passed before the pre-trial stage or during the pendency of the trial process, is purely an interlocked order or intermediate order, the feasible test is whether by way, of, uh, by way of upholding that order or reversing that order, whether it would have the effect of terminating the main proceedings of the case once for all and whether it puts an end to that case or not. 
that is the test to determine whether or to adjudicate or to decide whether it is an intermediate order or purely an interlocked order attracting the bar under section 397 clause 2 crpc i think i am clear uh, anybody got any doubt i think i made my best effort to explain i think but you have to answer if if anybody got any doubt i can clarify it that's why before going to the next aspect on that now what are the interlocked order which clearly attracts the bar under section 397 clause 2 crpc has been dealt with uh, one of the best judges on criminal side of the uh, astral high court of andhra pradesh justice tc h surya ragaru in a very celebrated judgment bongir kiran kumar versus state of ap in this case referring all these cases earlier cases right from amarnath case 77 madhulimiya case 1978 pc suklas case everything ultimately the speaking for the high court of andhra pradesh and high court of andhra pradesh has enumerated certain orders which clearly attracts the bar under 397 clause to crpc against which revision is not maintainable under 397 clause 1 crpc they are all filing petitions on 391 only 91 crpc summoning the documents or summoning the witnesses or filing uh, petitions under application 311 crpc to summon the witness or to recall the witnesses or filing applications on 205 crpc for grant of special vakalat or all certain orders are enumerated therein for our guidance as a presidential guidance to ascertain whether a particular order is an interlocked order attacked in the bar on 397 clause to crpc or not so this is one judgment which throws like presidential uh, guidance on this uh, aspect and i would like to request all the youngsters and the educators here as well as the law students to go through this judgment and uh, previous, uh, earlier i have referred the judgment of uh, madhulim amarnath case you can note down the citation ar 1977 supreme court 2185 this is the first judgment after the amendment which has carved out this concept of uh, a new a third order and a new order called as intermediate order by way of judgment law then the next judgment is madhulimiya's case that is AR 1978 Supreme Court, page 47. These two judgments can be said to be the authority on this uh, topic relating to maintenance of revisions against interlocked orders and 397 class 2 CRPC. Now, interesting question is, uh, this citation, uh, Bangir uh, Kedi, Bongir Kiran Kumar versus State of AP. The citation you want, huh? The Manapatra di Saru, you can buy this. I'll give Now, the next important question, uh, which is very interesting to the advocates here, because it is uh, they, they always take advantage of this phraseology used in the uh, Amarnath's case and Madhulimiya's case. They say, while uh, introducing this new, new concept or new order called an intermediate order, we have discussed how to determine whether a particular order is intermediate order or not. The test is whether it, it terminates the proceedings of the main case once for a lot is the main test. Incidentally, what Amarnath and Madhulimi have said that when an order which is touching the important rights and liabilities of the parties in respect of the trial of the case, note down, when the order is touching 
the important rights and liabilities of the party in respect of the trial of the case or an order which is of moment moment of gains momentum matter of moment they are to be considered as interme uh, intermediate orders is the phraseology or the term that is used by the apex court both in amanas case and madalimayas case now taking advantage of this expression advocates used to argue before the court suppose a three round question is there you come up with a plea that sir sir certain important questions are not put to the witness in the cross examination which goes to the root of the matter therefore please re uh, i request the court to recall that witness to enable me to cross examine witness on that test part aspect court dismissed you comes to revision then you says that sir my right to effectively cross examine witness is denied because i am deprived of putting an important question to him which goes to the root of the matter so my right is in this regard is touching the root of the matter therefore it has to be construed as intermediate order that is one argument that was addressed even before me in the high court also then pw1 was present the first witness advocate was not present on that day defense advocate his cross examination was recorded nil then you subsequently file a petition to recall this witness for cross examination magistrate dismisses it you come in revision then you same argument you will put forward sir my right to cross examine the witness is now denied maybe on that day advocate was absent it is the fault of the counsel not the part of fault of the party my right to uh, cross examine him is denied so my right and liability in respect to the main case is affected therefore it is to be construed as an intermediate order very interesting argument at the first blush it will strike to your mind yes it can be construed as an intermediate order what do you say all on this can we construe it as intermediate order a petition under 11311 crp which was dismissed owing to the options of the advocate on account of his uh, non cross examination then these are two instances another one third instance third issue i'll give 45 evidence act now there is 138 case and i act now the accused can uh, has taken a plea that the promise note is forged or check is forged now you file a petition to send the document to the expert for comparison to ascertain whether the disputed signature on the check tallies with the uh, admitted signature of the witness that petition is dismissed now you come under a revision now you say sir my contention is that it is a forged check i did not sign it now i want to send it to the expert to prove my defense that is denied now so it touches my right and liability relating to the main case can we construe it as an intermediate order to everyone at the first bless it appears to be there is some merit in the contention but unfortunately we can't hold that is the interpretation given by the court including me as a judge speaking for the andhra pradesh high court see and uh, one judgment was cited before me of course i have dealt with this case that was reported also which i am going to furnish to you all they have cited one judgment before me of uh, the madurai bench of madras high court where the learned judge has agreed with the contention raised by the counsel when a check was there based on the basis of which a case under section 138 was filed and the accused had taken a plea that it was forged and he want to prove his plea by way of sending the document to the expert and that is denied therefore relying on the phraseology or the expression or the term used in madalimiya and amarnath that that as it touches the important right and liability of the party in in connection with the trial of the case and as go to root, go to the root of the matter it can be construed as an intermediate order and therefore the learned singer there allowed the uh, maintained the revision 
and he said revision is maintainable the same judgment was cited before me therefore now my task is to interpret again what is actually meant by the term or expression touching the right of the parties in relation to the trial or what is an order of mom, uh, order which is of gain some momentum then after going through the madulamiya and amarnath carefully and finding out the intention of the supreme court there in introducing that concept ultimately the andhra pradesh high court has to hold that uh, only those orders even ultimately test is again see the, the feasible test is again to see that whether by upholding or reversing that order it would have the effect of terminating the main proceedings of the case or not that is the main law laid down by apex court both in madulimiya and amarnath so by upholding this order under one, under section 45 311 or the 91 whatever it may be it decides nothing finally relating to the main case the proceedings will be still there it does not in any way dispose of the main case or terminate the main proceedings therefore we can't hold it that these orders are intermediate orders ultimately the right and liability of the party must be in relation to the main result of the case for example i have discussed the 203 orders dismissal of case or refusing to take cognizance or taking cognizance discharge they are the right touching relating to the ultimate result of the case and they are dispose of the main case itself by upholding that order therefore we can't hold that it is an order of it is an intermediate order to maintain revision under 397 crpc and this was dealt with uh, 2020 recent year 2020 crlj 1696 page number 2000 crlj 1696 in the case of uh, goli sachinarayan reddy versus mahesh and others and this judgment was reported in in other uh, journals also like alt and all but i request the readers to go through this uh, crlj because the reporting is somewhat uh, a better reporting paraphrasing and all absolutely reflecting my thought as it is in these judgments that's why uh, 2006 year yeah, that's what i'm saying just is roy speaking for the i got a pandar pradesh as a <laughs> let down the law <laughs> and i have to ultimately in this case uh descent with the uh, um, disagree with the judgment of the madurai bench uh, in this case all twin shield and here another interesting question is now revision is not maintainable against an interlocutor order three and seven clause to bar suppose a pa- third party is there now just now we discussed that uh, if a party to the proceedings files a petition to summon a document on 92 to crpc if that is dismissed you can't come under revision bar under 397 class to crpc now i'll give you one interesting uh, uh, example here uh, a person who is not a party to the proceedings who is a third party was summoned to produce the document now a files a complaint under 138 ni act against b now b takes some defense now to prove his defense he wants to summon one document from the third party c who is not a party to this petition court allowed that petition 92 petition yes you come and produce the document now c a third party uh, got an objection why should i present my document in relation to their case now he questions that order in revision he comes in revision now can the court say that uh, no re- intermediate interlocutor order revision not maintainable admittedly it is not an intermediate order but it will not terminate the main proceedings it is undoubtedly an interlocutor order very interesting question anybody can answer again the supreme court in 1970s answered this issue very interesting question 
that's why we have to really appreciate the wisdom of the judges there of of 1970s time Three judge bench of Supreme Court in the case of Parameshwari Devi versus State of and uh, versus State reported in A I R 1977 Supreme Court 403. Very interestingly, Supreme Court held, see, he is a third party to the proceedings, so for he is concerned, we have to treat it as a final order because he will not have an opportunity to question the same. Suppose that party to the proceeding can question that order at least in an appeal, subsequently, in incidentally, but a third party will not have any opportunity because there is no right of appeal provided against that order. If you shut out his remedy of revision also, then what is the remedy to him? Already we have dealt with at the outset that. The purpose of introducing this concept of reason is that nobody should be left without any remedy. No person will be left without remedy. If you deny this right to this third party, how can he question the order? Then if you deny this right to this third party, how can he question the order? What is the remedy to him? Then Supreme Court very interestingly held that term, para seven of that judgment. If the order is, you can just listen to this observation. If the order is directed against a person who is not a party to the inquiry or trial, and he will have no opportunity to challenge it after the final order is made affecting the party's concern, then for such person, the order could could not be said to be interlocutory. Any order may be conclusive with reference to the stage at which it is made, and it may also be conclusive as to a person who is not a party to the inquiry or trial. Against whom it is directed. So, from the standpoint view of the party who is a third party to the proceedings, we have to consider this case. That is ultimately the Supreme Court held. So, so far as that third party is concerned, we have to, we have to treat it as a final order, though it is passed and took charge. For, for so far as he is concerned, he can maintain a revision. An interesting question, which very occasionally may arise, in, which is useful to the advocate. This is practicing on criminal side. Then we have been dealing with uh, what is the actual interpretation to the phraseology or the expression rights which are affecting the uh, orders which are affecting the rights of the parties in relation to the trial, as held by Supreme Court in Amarnath and Madhulimya. This was this was this this. Aspect has again come up for consideration before the three-judge bench of the Supreme Court in Girish Kumar Suneja. That is the latest judgment on this. That was also referred by me in my judgment. They have they have explained this phraseology. Then they held that uh, every order cannot be brought within the ambit of that uh, expression. Suppose that was in, while interpreting the same. In fact, I have also made my own. Uh, Uh, i also express my opinion also if that contents is accepted then every order will come within that ambit then we will be dial by way of giving that interpretation uh, we will be we, it, it will have the effect of diluting the very legislative intent in introducing this 397 class to bar to maintain a revision that was all dealt by the three judge bench again recently in uh, girish kumar suneja that was reported in 2017 supreme court ar 2017 supreme court 3690 
and I have extracted the relevant uh, observations made by the EPEX score in uh, this Grish Kumar Suneja at para number 25 of uh, the my judgment reported in 2020 CRLJ in uh, Goli Sachanarana Reddy case. Therefore, ultimately, the conclusion is that uh, revision lies only when right of appeal is not provided and it right lies only against a final order. Revision doesn't lie against an interlocked order. Again, revision lies, revision lies against a, sorry, it doesn't lie against uh, interlocked order. Again, revision lies against an intermediate order. I'm clear. So there are three orders now. As far as 397 is concerned, final order, intermediate order, interlocked order. So revision lies against final order and intermediate order. Revision doesn't lie against an interlocked, pure interlocked order. Because this 311 CRPC judgment orders and 91 CRPC orders, in Shetu Raman's case, 2009 uh, Supreme Court, uh, one crimes. Uh, the Supreme Court held that orders are passed under 311 CRPC and 92 CRPC are pure and simple interlocked orders attracting the bar under section 397 clause 2 CRPC, therefore revision lies. So now it is not open to content before the benches, before the courts that since it would have the effect of affecting the rights of the parties in relation to the main trial, that it has, uh, it has to be considered as an intermediate order. Supreme Court has ruled out that in Setu Raman's case, as well as his Girish Kumar Suneja's case. So, when you want to test whether a particular order is a final order, intermediate order, or interlocked order, these are the broad parameters laid down by the courts, both by the Supreme Court and also the High Courts to maintain revisions under 397, Clause 1, CRPC. Similarly, another interesting question has come up before the Supreme Court that whether an order refusing to take remand by a magistrate, suppose police arrests a person, they produce him before a magistrate, and magistrate for some reason refuse to take remand, then whether the prosecution can maintain a revision. Is the question before the apex court in 2004, I'll give you the citation right now, I'm not, it's not available with me. Supreme Court held that revision is not maintainable against that order. And the problem, this problem has arisen only here in uh, Vijag only, in 2004 only, when Justice uh, Sitaram Murthy was the Metropolitan Session Judge here. Uh, after police arrested the accused. They produced him before the local magistrate here. He refused to remand him. Then the police filed a revision before the Metropolitan Session Judge Court here. Then on that night, when we, the additional judges by then, myself, Mr. Murthy was there, it has come, for, come, come up for a discussion. They said, I think, uh, because they, they have no remedy, uh, we have to maintain revision. That was the opinion of uh, my colleague there. Exactly at that time only, the judgment of the Apex Court Justice A.R. Lakshman was the judge who rendered the judgment. That was reported. I come because I'm in the habit of following the march of law. Uh, it was in my knowledge at that time. Where the Supreme Court held that an order, whether accepting the remand or refusing remand, is pure and simple interlocked order against which revision is not maintainable attracting the bar under section 397, class 2 CRPC. Then what is the remedy then the next question arose? That is for the prosecution to deal with, what is their remedy? So I guess they have to question it before the constitutional courts invoking the jurisdiction or the inherent powers and all. But thing is that revenue is not maintained by that orders. So with this, uh, um, I would, uh, I would covered the important aspects relating to the subject of uh, revisions, particularly most vexed questions relating to maintainability of revisions under 397 class 2 CRPC against interlocking 
orders. So now it is, uh, we are in time, oh, we are exactly concluding at uh, 3.30, but if five minutes time, because you know, it is open to anyone to interact. If you got any doubt on that, we can discuss. Nobody got any doubt? So whether uh, I'm able to take it uh, <laughs> or I fail. <laughs> huh? What is the? Oh, limitation for revision. So right now I'm uh, limited. Huh? Nine. Senior advocate answers it. Ninety days, limited revision. And uh, somebody asked for that. Just uh, Surya asked the citation, judgment citation. Uh, 2002 ALD criminal, 355, equivalent to 2002 ALT criminal 318. This one. So, so no doubts. Uh, yes. Mike, Mike, Kevin, Mike. Sir, this is not with regard to revision, but uh, I would like to uh, get uh, one point uh, clarified. Uh, being a practicing advocate, sir, mm. uh, whether there is a provision for discharge under the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973 in a summons case, because time and again. No, no, no. Yes, yes. That is the answer. Shatterla. Uh, Adalat Prasad case, say, question of framing charge arises only in a warrant procedure case and a session style case. In a summons, I mean, summons case, there is no procedure of framing a charge. Only the substance of the accusation will be explained to the accused. That's all. When there is no question, when there is no procedure of framing charge, question of does, discharge does not arise. And this also a reported judgment of mine is there. I have answered all this in that judgment. I can give you. Sir, I, I have one small... Uh, See, answer. only test is that you can file a petition for discharge only in the cases where requirement of framing charge is there. That is in warrant procedure and in session trial. See, we have summary trials, summon trials, uh, warrant procedure trials, both private and police, and session trials. So, charges would be framed only in the warrant procedure and in the session trials. There will not be any framing of charges in summary trials and summons cases. Yes. In those two trial cases, you can't frame, file a petition for discharge. This was answered by Adal Supreme Court in Adalat Prasad case. Because earlier, there was a judgment of uh, our Supreme Court. Even though there is no uh, necessity to frame a charge, yes. still, court can discharge, entertain a discharge petition and uh, discharge him. That was overruled in Adalat Prasad's case. Supreme Court held that we, can, we have to follow the procedure prescribed under the procedure code when there is no requirement of framing a charge. Question of while entertaining discharge petition does not arise. That I will give you the citation. I will furnish to your president and you can Just do Just a it. small query, sir. Section 251 of CRPC. Matthew's case. Was the most uh, case. Yes. yes. Section 251 of CRPC. There is a phrase, sir, which, where it says, when notice is issued to the accused, the magistrate or the uh, court has to ask whether the accused has a defense. So I do not know whether that phrase, where the uh, magistrate has to ask whether the, uh, whether the accused has a defense, is, is being ignored. Because if, suppose, there is a defense that the accused has, he can definitely tell it at the stage of 251 CRPC. Uh, I believe, sir, uh, unfortunately, that is not being uh, taken into consideration. Because only in summons, uh, private complaints, even in Section 258 CRPC, if it is instituted, if it is summons case instituted on police report, then also there is a provision for discharge. But only in summons private cases, unfortunately, accused are being deprived of the right to file a discharge petition. Even that phrase where the accused has a defense to make is not being taken into consideration. It's my humble opinion, sir. The law declared by the Supreme Court is binding on all of us. But I believe this is a gapping hole where, unfortunately, accused like in defamation cases, section 500, sir. I, I have a case where the accused have a truth as a defense, but they cannot take that because the magistrate de dismissed no, the no, discharge you can, application. You can adduce your defense evidence after the 330 examination. You got right. But that is also suffering the rigors of the trial, sir. In warrant cases. That's what. See, in such case, both summons cases, you can't 
file a petition for discharge because such a procedure is not contemplated under the court. Yes, sir. Okay. That was clearly answered by the Supreme yes, Court. Thank Maybe you, sir. Like that. And uh, before uh, parting with uh, this, uh, so far as 397 revisions is concerned, uh, and one important aspect just I will uh, touch it and uh, I will conclude. But uh, this may not be to the liking of the advocates, but it is an important aspect. Whether a revision court, session judge or a high court entertaining a revision under 397 can grant a stay of trial of the proceedings. Suppose you file a revision before the session judge against a particular order passed by the magistrate and you ask for stay of the trial of the case. Because when I was session judge here, well, 138 case was there, many 138. And they filed some petition under 311 CR for recall of witness for further cross-examination. That is, if that is dismissed, they used to come to revision and obtain stay of proceedings, trial of the case, entire case, stall the proceeding there, till the revision is disposed of before the court. And when I took charge in uh, fourth area court, I think here, about more than 100 uh, trials are stalled on account of the stale, stays granted by sessions court. Then I had to make a, some survey of law. Can the court, sessions court judge, can order for stay of trial process? Then my study revealed that such power of stay of trial process is not conferred on the either session judge or the high court under 397 CRPC. Then I heard the senior advocates by all of them then. They said uh, if, the, if the trial process is allowed to go on, before this revision petition is dismissed, disposed of, then what, the purpose of this revision will be defeated like that. I am not concerned all that. I am concerned with my power. I can't exercise a power which is not conferred on me. I am a session judge. 397 says, session judge or high court can entertain revision. So as a session judge, the power to stay the uh, trial process is to be conferred on me by the court itself. I can't exercise the power which is not conferred on me. Then I said, read the section first. Section lay munta dente. Yakkada goda, session judge or the high court can stay the trial under the yakkada under the, that power is not conferred under the, by the court on the courts. All that is stated in the section is, the court can suspend the operation of the order that is questioned. That is the wording used. So, you, your petition is dismissed. Is, suppose your petition is allowed, three rounds petition is allowed to recall a witness. Other party, adverse party who is agreed by that comes before revision. Then suppose if I entertains a revision, I can suspend the operation of that order. A recall, you know, uh, suspend jaygal. That's all. But I can't stay the proceedings there. Then, suppose a petition is filed for 311 or 392, that was dismissed. Questioning that order, it was there. A suspension, what is there? Your petition is dismissed there. Allow just then and a suspend just then. You dismiss just then, even suspend just then. See, these are all the anomalies which, uh, in my experience as a session judge, now in the high court, uh, we have pointed out. So ultimately, my survey of law disclosed that under 397 CRPC, session judges or high courts have no power to stay the trial proceedings. At best, you got the power to suspend the order. That again, I'll give you that example. 125 CRPC only. Maintenance grand judge or husband against her. Husband comes and questions it under revision. You can suspend that order out of revision. Atlage, uh, he was convicted, sentence of less than three, years, three months is imposed. Two, two months or one month away, sir. Challenging that conviction, you are before the revisional court because revision lies. 376 bar, uh, appeal bar on the property, revision lies. There, again, the session court has suspend the sentence, execution of the sentence. That is why the wording used here is in 97, 397. See, uh, 
and the session judge at high court while calling for such record direct that the execution of any sentence order be subject be suspended and if the accused is in confinement that he be released on bail on his bond so this is the power conferred on the on, on the session judges and the or on the regional regional courts only to suspend the execution of the sentence or order but stay of proceedings is not conferred that power is not conferred that is my view whether uh, the participants no, agree with me or not no, is left to the wisdom of the thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk thank you sir i request my friends to felicitate the honorable justice manvendra rai garu all this is streamed online from tomorrow any one of you can view this program any part of it through your mobile by downloading the mobile app that was developed by the bar council of ap our felicitation of the honorable justice manvendra rai garu now this one day seminar comes to an end successfully i thank uh, the everyone who contributed to make it successful firstly to the learned judges who spared their valuable time and with us all the day and i also thank the association particularly the president of the association who has been with us and he has done every possible thing to make this program successful one we will be failing in my duty we will be failing in our duty if we don't remember the land advocate general though he is absent but for his indulgence we would not have get this hall and we thank everyone and we thank the next program people also for accommodating bearing with us this much time thank one and all for making this a successful especially the participants this will encourage us to conduct this kind of program again and again thank you thank you one and all we raise for janagana mana open id on lo అందరూ పాడండి జనగణ మనాయక జయ హే భారత భాగ్య విధాత పంజాబ సింధు గుజరాత మరాఠ ద్రావిడ ఉత్కల గంగా వింధ్య హిమాచల యమునా గంగా ఉచ్చల జలది తరంగ తవ శుభ నామే జాగే तव शुभाशिष मागे गाहे तव जय गाधा जनगण मंगलदायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय जय हे हे जय हे నేను అడిగే క్వశ్చన్ అడగడానికి అవసరం లేదు గుడ్ ఐ మే బి జస్ట్ ఫర్ యువర్ పర్సన్ ఫర్ ద నెక్స్ట్ టైం ఇడికే